Sayın dekanlarım, kıymetli konuklar ve sevgili öğrenciler. İkinci Uzay Ekonomisi, Uzay Hukuku ve Uzay Bilimleri Sempozyumumuzun dördüncü oturumuna hoş geldiniz. Oturum başkanı olarak İstanbul Üniversitesi Fen, Fen Fakültesi Dekanımız Sayın Profesör Doktor Fensal Akı davet ediyorum. Şimdi ise Oturumda tebliğ sunacak kıymetli araştırmacıları takdim etmek istiyorum. Sayın Profesör Doktor İbrahim Küçük, Sayın Profesör Doktor Cahit Yeşil Yaprak, Sayın Doçent Doktor Arif Karabeyoğlu, Sayın Profesör Doktor Emrah Kalenci, Sayın Profesör Doktor Alim Rüstem Aslan ve Sayın Doktor Öğretim Üyesi Onur Keskin. Sözü oturum başkanı Sayın Profesör Doktor Tansar Akı veriyorum. Buyurun hocam. Hepinize hoş geldiniz. Ee, bugünkü ha, var bende teşekkür ederim. Bu oturumda ben başkanlık edeceğim. Her oturum başkanı bir şeyler söyledi. Çok kısa bir şey söyleyeyim. Ee, Rönesans, dün Sayın Hoca'ya da söyledim. Rönesansı ve sanayi devrimini ıskalamış bir toplumda e, uzay çağını yakalama hedefi çok e, hayali gibi görünebilir belki ama e, bu coğrafyanın hayalleri yakalama konusunda çok sağlam deneyimleri var. Biz hiç beklenmedik şeyleri beklenmedik zamanlarda yapabilen bir toplumuz. Cumhuriyet'in kurucu atalarının gösterdiği hedefi Bugün yakalamak için e, yeterli birikime sahip olduğumuza inanıyoruz. E, onun için de bu toplantıyı e, yol gösterici olmak için, e, hedef göstermek için, yöntem göstermek için ve kararlılığımızı ifade etmek için e, düzenlediğimize inanıyorum. E, Ülkemizin issues and our country's space related activities and the space sciences and the point we have arrived in our country will be discussed with certain views and opinions and we've got uh, valuable speakers among us and the first speaker is from the Turkish Space Agency Professor Ibrahim Küçük and uh, Professor Ibrahim is also uh, Uh, she, uh, he is the astronomy and space sciences uh, department uh, academic from K uh, Kayseri University and he's going to be talking about the place of astronomy in the national space program and the goals of the Turkish Space Agency in astronomy. If he is online and connected, we're going to greet him and listen to his speeches. Thank you very much, Professor Tansel. I would like to thank all the organizers and all the attendees and I would like to wish you a wonderful morning. Thank you very much for organizing this meeting. It is indeed really important. And this is the second edition of such meetings with the, <coughs> the support of three faculties, actually two faculties and one academy. And As the Turkish Space Agency, we deem your efforts very valuable and we are honored to be among you. And we are going to attend, even though if it's uh, through a remote connection. And as you have mentioned, uh, uh, Turkey's uh, national space program, uh, almost uh, fourth or four or fifth, five items in the program are covered and we do all we all know that uh, we need to explain this relation and this connection in turkey and with your permission i would like to share my presentation uh, i think we can do this 
uh, I'm not sure if you can see my full screen. This is, uh, I would like to talk about two, uh, I'm going to try to explain it in two different uh, ways. When we talk about astronomy and space sciences in Turkey, first I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to talk about the space program and Turkey's perspectives and what are the future goals and uh, targets. And first I have to let you know that when I'm talking about the future goals, as you all know, the Turkish Space Agency is an umbrella uh, organization. And our tasks include, like you have mentioned, it is to uh, organize the chaos. And one does not perceive it as a chaos, but uh, it is a coordination entity to gather all the separate and individual uh, entities underneath it and to serve uh, in this direction. And in line with that goal and target, it is our duty and mission is to ensure that we carry out these duties. Uh, when we talk about the space agency and let us see the general situation, as you all know, uh, the Turkish Space Agency was founded in the year 2018 with the presidential decree number 23. Uh, with the the objective is to uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, foreign dependency in aviation, space sciences and technology, to increase competitive edge in international arena, to constitute the infrastructure, uh, scientific and technological infrastructure, and to prepare support programs uh, for uh, R&D and state-of-the-art technology entrepreneurship in order to further new technologies. And as you know, since the uh, year 1957 with Sputnik, there's a new space concept that is around, even though uh, they took... Uh, we, we had been conducting studies on deep space long before, but we have this definition, which we are still uh, expanding. And our mission is to become a leading and pioneering company to, uh, for the good of our uh, country and for all humanity. This is our organizational structure. And I, uh, we've got two... We've got two structures underneath the, uh, uh, our uh, department and uh, uh, the space systems department and we've got advanced materials and the launching systems department and these are the systems that have been identified in advance and I've got four the divisions underneath me, astronomy, telescope systems, space researches, and also space uh, weather implementation center division. Uh, so uh, when it comes to astronomy and space sciences, the Turkish Space Agency's targets will uh, try to be explained by myself. And the activities carried out by us include uh, uh, satellites, launching devices and systems, uh, air vehicle simulators, space platforms, and all space-related products, technologies, systems, facilities, tools and devices, the design, production, integration, and the necessary tests are done by us through plans, projects, and activities, or we have such activities done and procured, and accordingly, <coughs> we've got bilateral relations and international activities that are very really important. And uh, when we are ensuring an international coordination, bilateral and international uh, relations must be taken into account. And we have to take the uh, right steps. You see 24 countries, but this is increasing. And particularly the countries that have been highlighted are the countries with which preliminary debates are being carried out. And we've got bilateral agreements, memorandum of understanding with many countries. And uh, this was the case, you know, we, we, because of the pandemic, we had video conferences because we couldn't meet face to face. And these were 
meetings that were held at a senior level, and the, the Roscosmos and the SpaceX company, Roscosmos of uh, U, uh, Russia and SpaceX of U US are the companies that we are uh, collaborating with, and in June we're going to have a US visit to further our relations with them. And also we've got memberships, we've got organizational memberships, one of which I want to mention, the Asian Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, APSCO. And yesterday, the Deputy uh, General Secretary, Ferhat Fikri Özeren, was uh, online, uh, and uh, he's representing us in that entity, which is currently uh, continuing. And when we talk about bilateral uh, relations and international activities, is there is the International Astronomical Federation, IAF, is an entity that we are a member of, and there is going to be an international space conference that will be held in 2025, and we are a candidate city for hosting it. The fact that if, if, if that Kospar, ISNET, COPUAS in the United Nations and URC are the also, we, we've got uh, collaborations with these entities and as you know recently it was last week that the Turkish Space Agency announced its strategic plan of 2022 to 2026. The strategic goals are listed, there are four items that I tried to explain but particularly the education and social responsibility is very important and these four articles particularly the astronomy and space sciences community is going to be a stakeholder in terms of training and the subsequent implementations and projects and what kind of a responsibility has been undertaken as explained and uh, these include identifying the Turkish space industry training education po po policy and encouraging and the supervision of education activities and education program and plan preparation, implementation and assessment within the scope of national space program and the course of seminars and similar activities being coordinated, supervised and delivered and also leading uh, interest and curiosity in general, uh, space and uh, aerospace sciences and technologies. This is, uh, these are the activities that we deem as very important. These are the general Turkish uh, Space Agency's uh, perspective in my division. And when we see in this slide, we see the existing observatories that are uh, operating in Turkey. I do not want to name their names, but you will see here, there's this information that you see on the map, and you see the foundation years of these observatories on the uh, Turkish map. All these observatories cover almost all Turkey, particularly with the Southeast Anatolian Observatory. This is a network that expands across the country. And of course, these, uh, uh, the, the, the, I don't want to call them the oldest or the newest, but it is quite important that we have come to this stage. And you see a summary of the observatories. Our first observatory was founded in 1911 with the Istanbul Kandili Observatory, followed by uh, subsequent observatories and as per uh, as of 2021 we've got 16 observatories and they are all serving for the purpose of sciences and to uh, help the society and our inventory shows that as of 2021 the infrastructure of the observatories contains 36 telescopes. There could be newly bought ones or obsolete ones and a majority are small telescopes with diameters less than one meter and there are only four telescopes with one uh, that are bigger than one meter and uh, there is the DAG, the Southeast Observatory Telescope that uh, have a four meter mirror dia uh, diameter 
and uh, there are also satellite-based astronomy activities uh, with spectrum activities. And in our astronomy and astrophysics community, our areas of interest uh, include the solar system and the far planet system, solar physics, small planets and astro asteroids. And uh, you will see, you can see the uh, sub uh, activities of these and exoplanets. And there is the National Space Program. Uh, and with this, uh, you will see it under the, with the perspective of this, the astronomy and astrophysic activities. You should see the Turkish Space Agency's activities. There are 10 of them, as you know. The five, six, a part of Article 10, you will see, is entirely uh, focused on astronomy and astrophysics and space sciences uh, as they concern us and uh, you would uh, these are associated with uh, engineering and other disciplines because it requires uh, interdisciplinary collaboration and cooperation which we have to include here and that I have to mention particularly and what is being done about this? There are five targets. Target five is, <clears throat> let me take a, there is technological resources on space weather. We see a space weather implementation center is uh, about to be built and we have efforts to that end. We call it UHUM. When we talk about solar weather, if you think of the heliosphere, it's so the sun because the sun is an active star and there are activities and there's the radiation that reaches the earth. So uh, there are uh, this radiation, there's an interaction both in the uh, setting between the sun and the earth and also our atmosphere is also affected by that. So if we summarize it, we're, uh, this is going to be a center where we can carry out such activities, related activities. And also, I can briefly inform you about the objectives of the Space Weather Implementation Center and why are we working on such a, uh, towards such a goal. The concrete goal is to uh, bring about a warning uh, now cast and forecast systems are now cast which is uh, the forecast of the present time uh, and uh, we've got risk management on communication related matters uh, and particularly you know the sun uh, it's an area of interest and area of activity, both for astronomy and astrophysics, but and particularly in the because this concerns the astronomy community, this is very important. And another issue is the sixth target. Let us see it: the uh, terrestrial observation and monitoring of space objects. And uh, this is not like terrestrial uh, observation through telescopes, but the potentially threatening objects and satellites and the state, uh, the, the space uh, debris uh, that is going to be monitored uh, by us. But when we look at the terrestrial observations, we can do it in three ways, in three spectra. Uh, the optical observations, as you know, Tubitak has a, a national observatory and also with small telescopes in our university. And uh, in the infrared area, uh, extra red area, the Eastern Anatolian uh, observatory is going to help out with the... Uh, we are going to... we are accelerating the relevant activities. And in radio astronomy, and in the long wavelength, our observations are going to start and the Turkish Space Agency is carrying out its coordination and support activities in line with this program. So can you please wrap up in five to six minutes? Because we're running out of time, sir. Sure. 
I'm approaching the end. Our ninth objective is to create awareness and to uh, develop human rights uh, resources. And when it comes to space resources, using astronomy and the concepts of astronomy, uh, people of all ages, you know, from children to the most senior citizens, space is an interest of everyone. And this is very, very valuable, and therefore creating this awareness is very important for the Turkish Space Agency as well. And our biggest issue is that we are holding such meetings and trying to create awareness. But most important issue, our most important issue is human resources. And particularly those that are working in astronomy is very few, as you know. And we've got problems in other areas. So when you look at the general landscape, in technology as well, in space technology, the number of people who work in this area, the professionals, are very few. So increasing awareness as well as human resources is important to, in, to bring about. Uh, uh, this is going to be done, thinking of the awareness and education concepts together. And the tenth target, which we can assess together with the ninth target, because the awareness is a part of it, because as you know right now, as it has been announced, a Turkish citizen will be sent to the International Space Station and right now the applications are continuing and there's going to be an audition process and that person who will be sent is going to uh, go through, uh, we intend that individual, that citizen, to conduct a few scientific uh, experiments. So our objective is to send a Turkish citizen and help uh, that person stay there for seven to ten days and to uh, carry out a scientific mission that is pre-identified. On the right hand side the graph shows uh, the opportunities and the means afforded in which areas, what kind of scientific activities can be done. These are set in advance, these are preset activities. So the applicants that will apply will have them in front of them. So in line with the science mission, uh, this is going to bring about a space awareness and the interest of the new generation in space will be increased. So this is the objective of our scientific mission and this soon we're going to announce it and we're going to announce it through TÜBİTAK, the Turkish Scientific Authority. So we're going to choose the first Turkish astronaut and the concepts of uh, science mission is a part of the national space program and in order to ensure all this coordination as the Turkish Space Agency we have signed a collaboration protocol with the Turkish Astronomy Association because uh, particularly in astrophysics the people who are working on this and in order to access this human resources and to correctly tap into this know-how requires a, a representation uh, duly uh, and all the astronomists, astrophysicists and the space scientists are represented in the Turkish Astronomy Association. So this uh, collaboration uh, agreement, which is a five-year agreement, uh, will help uh, us carry out our activities to fulfill the objectives that we have mentioned. And this is going to use, in addition to the fundamental sciences, the space sciences uh, perspective is very valuable and we intend to sustain this uh, along with the existing system. And uh, there is a law uh, and uh, it's about the, there is a bill that is about to pass the parliament because it has been ordered with a decree. So if it is converted into a law, um, these 10 targets as well as the articles that we are interested in will be able to be fulfilled much more easily. And this is going to be announced real soon. And our project objectives are about to be announced. We just have one signature pending. And once we announce it, the Turkish Space Agency will become a project producing entity. It will have that identity. We do conduct projects, but this will be a full-fledged status once we have the law. And the Turkish astronomy community will 
position itself in the, uh, among these activities with the Turkish Astronomy Association. Thank you very much for listening to me and for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to uh, I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Most of the time we have the questions to all at the end of the session, but if there are any questions from the audience, then we can have one or two questions. Thank you very much. So out of what, uh, from all the information, Ibrahim Bey. So there's a question. Can you, can you, hear, can you hear us? So please talk to the microphone. So it occurred to me in the last second, thank you very much for giving me the floor. So what I'm curious to know, so financing is a very important topic. And so can you please share with us a figure about the budget that can be allocated by our, by our country to these space-related activities? I'm really curious. Yes, uh, so, we, uh, so we watch uh, and we follow this project with admiration and with hope but uh, resources are very important so so is there a certain amount that uh, you can share with us or how is go how is going to be raised uh, is going to be borrowed thank you very much for this question so i will i will kind of ask you to apologize me i know that there is a sufficient budget but uh, however so our president has the authority to share with you these figures so it's not possible for for me to make this uh, to now uh, to reveal this now, but it's good. It's good that we uh, we have it. There's enough money. So following Ibrahim Bey, we will have Professor Jai Tishiri uh, Aprak, and of Koch University, we will have Associate Professor Aif Karabeyolu of Samaj University, Professor Emrah Kalemji of Istanbul Teknik University, Alim Rustem Astan, and last of all, and from the foundation of his uh, schools. And we will have Dr. Onur Keskin. Uh, Onur, we, uh, Mr. Onur and, and Mr. Arif are with us today, so we'll be, uh, they'll be making their presentations physically. So I'd like to welcome them all. So our next speaker. So uh, something then drew my attention from what Ibrahim Bey said. Maybe that has to do with my own field. As you know that our population is is about 80 million, and so and given this population, we have 120 or 130 astronauts, or, or maybe half of them are in active um, research. This is an incredible number. Human resource resources are of vital importance, so we kindly uh, invite uh, our academics to. Uh, provide PhDs for people and also to engage people in research. So uh, we will have Yash Jahid Nishil Chaprak of Atatürk University. Uh, the most important characteristic of him uh, is that he is the implementer of the largest observatory of Turkey and we are getting, we are approaching the first slide in this project and to, um, so he will inform us about Atasam and you may start. Uh, so you'll have 15 minutes. I'll do my best. Ah, so it's a very dangerous answer. Don't worry. I'll try to abide by time. First and foremost, I'd like to extend my thanks to Istanbul University and also the relevant faculties and also the observatory house for making this symposium a traditional. So this is a process. And and also, you also ensure that this process is also recorded as well and about the space mission and also space uh, ecosystem. Many developments are being experienced and, and such a symposium has started with this process is very important from a social and technical point of view. And I attended the first one and I'm so pleased to be attending the second version as well. And thank you very much for your invitation. And so if I may, I'll have a presentation as well. I think you can see my slides.
So this is the title that I've chosen for the second volume of this meeting. So I think this is a continuation of my previous presentation. So this process is a developing stage by stage. Maybe it's proce proceeding. It's a bit slow for us. Uh, so we are we are founding the largest observatory of Turkey, but at the same time, there's another task assigned to us. So uh, we uh, we are also creating the ecosystem for space sciences as well. Uh, we are achieving this not only with an observatory, but and we are also creating the other infrastructure and uh, so that the system can stand uh, on its own feet and so including human resources as well that's why so Atatürk university astrophysic research and application center and is the center in which we are founding this observatory and so this is this is about creating an R and D infrastructure and also restructuring of it as well, and with a couple of laws. Uh, so that we are talking about a new process of reconstruction. And so I need to make a couple of definitions. One of them is what Atasam. I've already told you what it is. It's Astrophysic University, Astrophysic Research and also Research and Application Center. So its field of uh, activity is space sciences and also optical sciences and technologies. And uh, as of this year, Atatürk University has become a research university and, and I think uh, this has made a great contribution to this university becoming an, a research university. Uh, so there are two R and there were two uh, R and D infrastructures uh, within the scope of Atasam. At, uh, at so one of them is the Eastern Anatolian uh, Observatory and the second one is the uh, uh, Opti Mechatronic uh, Research Laboratory. So, so, um, so we have two infrastructures, and so uh, space. Uh, the definition of space science is found uh, in many places, uh, but there could be. Uh, although there are some varying uh, opinions within our community as well, and uh, so uh, astrosciences also covers astronomy and also astrophysics and all the areas. So it's a generic name. So within this structural transformation, both in the development plan and also, so uh, we are now uh, recognizing it in the way it was used in the uh, law as well. And also optical scientists and technologies. It, it is about some experimental developments uh, in the field of uh, optical fields. Um, and also while making so uh, we set out uh, we set out based on uh, we set out these uh, we set out from these definitions when we were making a planning so we have we have completed some 85 percent of the foundation on and also from uh, so scientific observations will start from the end of 2023 and another one and in 2020 in so so so we have then uh, opto uh, mecha mechatronic uh, research laboratory, uh, which we plan to complete by the year 2023 or 2024. It will be so uh, it will provide services for large optics and also for design and also product development and also uh, of manufacturing as well. So uh, it has infrastructure and superstructure. And so, so these R and D uh, infrastructures are the, uh, the structures that will be serving space sciences. So I'd like to show you this as well. So, and so it was a bit more detailed in last year's presentation, but it's about the pros uh, progress that we made. We are about to finish everything. As I said, within one year we will start some test uh, observations, and if we don't face any problems, and if everything, if everything uh, goes as planned, and by the end of the year 2023. So we'll be making calls for projects from a side point of view as well. So this is the so optic laboratory that we are uh, planning to uh, commission in 2023 or 2024. So this is an optic laboratory within the campus. And also, so it will have a, a facility safety uh, uh, certificate as well. So studies will be made uh, uh, with a one, uh, one meter and above optics. And so this is about the establishment of an R&D infrastructure. So when starting with dark in Turkey, 
as you know that uh, so uh, this was uh, this was uh, uh, uh, uh, this was launched as one of the region projects for the year 2023 uh, it was it was beyond establishing an observatory first and foremost it was a university project and also the ministry of um, development uh, also included this in the in turkey's 2023 vision program and also it a uh, it uh, aimed to transform it into an R&D project which will result in the world as well. That's why, um, so we have, a start, uh, we have identified certain missions and missions. So I won't be reading this one by one, but as you can see, and so it will be filling a gap in this latitude and longitude. And also this is important for scientific diplomacy. And also, and so it, and also we will have a high technology for competitive research as well and so so we will be uh, accommodating and also developing these also uh, in this territory and also we'll be providing the scientific community with all the services both national and internationally as well as also mentioned by the previous speaker we will also be raising human resources and also we will implement uh, domestic technologies as soon as possible so this this is the mission and vision that we set out with, and also we've been um, uh, operating with these for the last five and six years, and within the scope of OPA. And so, uh, so uh, we must. Uh, I must tell you that it doesn't only consist of observation, and many is uh, maybe young people. Uh, many young people may not be aware of this, and also engaging in astronomy and space sciences uh, is also about optic system and also remote sensing and also optical coating and astronomic software and it goes as far as informatics so it's a multidisciplinary uh, endeavor and also uh, it also requires people from uh, various uh, disciplines and we try to create such a working environment that's why we'd like to, uh, so we, we are trying to we are making so uh, so this is uh, a um, milestone for the creation of an ecosystem in space sciences and when it comes to creating this ecosystem so we need to have some uh, grounds or justification so because we are only starting with an observatory and also we have the 11th development plan in which we are rapporteur and the second one is the national space program in which we uh, whose meeting we are attending as well and also uh, so as you know that the UN sustainable development uh, objectives uh, so uh, and also uh, we, we also need to find out to what extent we'll be serving these development goals as well and um, so we have the uh, research infrastructures law number 6550 and it's making it an independent uh, legal entity and so the universities, uh, so the university institutions will be self-sufficient and they'll be able to stand on their own feet. And, and with all these grounds, and so you need to identify, no, uh, you need to set your no strategic uh, target objectives and also they need to be overlapping with the priority areas of Turkey and your mission and vision and also your objectives should be identified. And these should be serving R&D and it should be beneficial about education and training and also it should have some social uh, benefits as well or contributions as well. And I think when we uh, think from the perspective of an observatory, the, hard, the, the most important challenge is to, is to uh, find out how we can serve the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations and so we can touch 11 of this so majority of these goals if this uh, as soon as these infrastructures are established and start providing services and but um, so we have a um, presented this to our own university to the strategy director general and also so uh, so we we believe that we will be able to touch almost every stage uh, and all, of all these objectives as well and we have shown that we are part of the ecosystem in space sciences as well within the scope as i said and so we're going through uh, a process of reconstruction and so last year and uh, we made a similar presentation as well so this presentation is a continuation of what i presented to you last year 
and in the next uh, symposium and uh, this will be recorded and we were talking about it the uh, uh, so we so that's why we consider this symposium very important um, as, as I said you see our mission and vision on the screen what will really matter is to be competitive and also the uh, preferred uh, and also uh, so we need to of course ensure this and um, we don't have such a telescope in this territory it is and also we need to also fulfill the requirements of being competitive and also the preferred uh, center observatory as well we need to have the right human resources and we, so we have some plans for so we have certain objectives and also activities for the first five years our main objective and and uh, um, is to establish and also start uh, operating the dark and opal r and d infrastructures as soon as possible and also we would like to provide observatory and also our, uh, observation and r and d infrastructure as soon as possible and also uh, we would like to engage in national and international cooperation and also and we would like to make contribution to r and d in various fields and also we'd like to make some social uh, contribution through some uh, educational and also uh, awareness related activities as well and so uh, we cannot share some of the uh, some of the activities about dark and opal and once it be, when it becomes official within one or two months uh, and uh, if this symposium uh, if a symposium is organized next year which uh, and we would like to also participate as well and so I would like to show you the parameters, uh, the, the performance metrics of Doug and Opal in next year's uh, symposium as well. We, uh, we have made many studies about this. And while creating this ecosystem, uh, so I mentioned some dimensions of this in last year's presentations uh, uh, as well. And so, uh, so uh, this has some dimensions and so we are aware that we have we have to be touching all of these and also there are some uh, strategic program and also uh, objectives as well transparency and also openness policy and we have taken the necessary steps in this in this sense as well and about our internal and external stakeholders and also users and in technology or innovation and so we have the most technological uh, telescope uh, within an, uh, the, uh, a dimension of four meters and then uh, and also uh, there will be a type uh, uh, so there's a need for a time meter a scale uh, meter and i believe that this need will be covered by the state and um, When it comes to vertical and horizontal technologies, we have so we have launched most of the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary or disciplinary activities or studies. Uh, so that so we have the great director general of astrology and also with this part of space agency, and we will conduct uh, certain studies with uh, under uh, Atasam. As I said, we have already launched some interdisciplinary studies in this area. Um, so uh, uh, uh, we have our fifth PhD candidate with us uh, in terms of sustainability and competitiveness as I said the, uh, the new law and also uh, the strategy budget uh, presidency and the university has been supporting this structure and this uh, new entity will be self-sufficient and also it will be provide uh, it will be is self-sufficient through R and D activities, and we need to proceed on a project-based to um, uh, in a project-based manner, and in, so we need to have a structure. Uh, so in terms of human resources, and also, uh, so we'd like to have trained human resources, and also a, a multidisciplinary. Uh, uh, we'd like to have a multidisciplinary human resources working with a team spirit, and. So those the data that's open to project owner for a, for a while should be available to everyone. And I believe that this is one of the sine qua nons of this ecosystem. And of course, social contribution is very important as well. As I said, our uh, objective is, 
then if you come up with a, a new a technical solution as r and or if you, for example, develop a product, then you need to be sharing with the society the outcomes of it and also you need to think about how it will contribute to the society and also to the industry and economy of the country. And, and uh, as I said, uh, we've already made some preparations about this as well and we are waiting for official approval. Once it's uh, approved by the Ministry of uh, Technology and Industry, most probably we will be presenting this to you in next year's symposiums as well. That's all from me for today. And th uh, we are so happy to have been invited to such a symposium. And, and so there is a, a transformation and it is, uh, it is very important that uh, a transformation about the creation of an ecosystem for, sports, uh, for space science is very pleasing. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than uh, happy to answer. Thank you. I said we're few in numbers, but look what we can do. So this has to do with having a vision and working towards the best. So if there are any questions, I can accept a few. Okay, sir, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we wish you the best. Thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Koç University's Associate Professor Arif Karabeyoğlu, and who is going to deliver a presentation on rocket te technologies. I would like to say welcome and please uh, start your presentation. Yeah, I'll do my best. Do you have the... Yes. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say good morning to all of you and thank you for being with us in this beautiful Sunday morning. And there is this dedication and devotion and we see so many people who are interested in spa space. My speech is a bit technical and I'm sorry because I have been dealing on rocket sciences. I wanted to talk about this with you and I'm going to go real fast and I'm going to try to finish it in uh, 15 uh, minutes. And if you got any questions, now the foundations of rockets uh, goes to Newton's and we use the laws of Newton and when you're driving an automobile you're using Newton's law, action and reaction and when your wheel is turning on the asphalt there's a reaction and likewise airplanes because they push uh, the uh, air with a reaction but in space you don't have that setting that you can push yourself forward which requires us to use another law of N Newton that is the preservation of linear momentum so in order the only way to get the only known way to get force in the space is to by throwing launching a mass in high speeds and uh, you getting a, a speed that will help you your forward propulsion in the space and this is what i i have shown in the first uh, lessons or in my lesson so the preservation of the first momentum and the less momentum uh, of the vehicle there's a very simple equation so what the force that propels that drives your rocket forward is actually uh, the <coughs> value of the mass uh, the flow rate in kilogram uh, divide per second of the mass and uh, the uh, gases, the speed of the gases leaving your rocket. So if you want an effect, you have to throw, propel the mass. And mass is not about energy only. You have to propel the mass because, uh, uh, and uh, unlike all the practices on Earth, this is what we learn and you have to propel it in high speed so that you can efficiently use that mass so to be frank this ve that is the velocity leaving the rocket has to be maximized and that's why you have to give as much energy as possible to the mass so this equation uh, helps us make a general classification of all the rockets we need a mass we said and we can do it on a mass basis and energy basis at the first level we do it on a mass basis so using which force uh, which force is used to accelerate this mass uh, and this is the energy. This is done by energy naturally. We call it the rocket uh, 
So if it's uh, accelerated with electronic waves, we call it the electric rocket systems. Or if you're using nuclear energy, we call it the nuclear rocket. And if we use chemical, that is combustion uh, energy, then we call it chem chemical records. And if you're using a co gas pressure, we call it cold gas types of systems. So when you look at it, uh, this is maybe beyond 99% of the rockets across the world. Almost all of them are chemical records. Uh, rockets because they are very simple this is number one and number two uh, they can give very high propulsion forces so uh, chemical rec uh, rockets we're careful about that and we want to classify them and we're building that on mass because as you know there's an oxidizing and there's a fuel and we have to do it together and the oxidizer and the fuel depending on the phases they are carried if they are in solid we call them solid fuel or we can if one is liquid and one is solid we call them the hybrid rockets and uh, uh, this is what i was trying to show you in a simple way and these are uh, as you will see uh, this is about an uh, because the oxidizing fuel is together so when you start this you cannot stop it and it goes wherever it goes and sometimes it explodes you see you now and liquid uh, fueled rockets are more are safer and there's a chamber pump that we send it to and we burn it in a controlled way to the best of our ability and we get the effect force but the presence of two liquids is a safety issue because two liquids coming together and mixing somewhere can bring about certain ox Explosives and we call them oxaliquid and they're more energetic than the solid explosives and uh, trust me you can have incredible results and there's a third rocket this is associated with safety and simplicity and we call them the hybrid flu, uh, fuel rockets so the oxidizing is liquid and solid is uh, fuel is solid but there is no oxidizing you know let alone exploding it can't even burn when i hit this place it is as danger harmless as this place that i'm touching it so this liquid oxidizer and solid fuel they cannot mix together easily it's not possible so exploding this chemically blasting it is impossible and in such chambers in stanford university i did fire such rockets and you can legally the only rocket type that you can legally do this is hybrid you know and you cannot do it with liquid or uh, solid and if anyone does do run away from that place and a step backwards i want to the propelling force we have drawn on the y-axis and on the x-axis i have drawn the velocity the exhaust speed i have shown you the uh, force the propelling force so that was the fuel's velocity leaving the rocket and I said the higher it is the better and we see this and the faster you uh, propel this fuel you use less fuel for the same message mission so we, when we talk about fuel savings that fuel saving in rockets comes with the propelling speed and it's a huge advantage in systems but there is yet another uh, issue that is the force of propelling force of propelling is very important in rocket science and there is one issue and in the propulsion uh, systems fuel savings is great the exhaust speeds velocities are great but the propulsion that you get is about one newton you know it's so small i cannot uh, measure it these are so difficult to measure so we cannot use it in many practices and other types of rockets, chemical rockets, we get high propulsion forces. And when you talk about fire, this huge Saturn V rocket, incredible masses, it takes it to the moon and you're firing that type of a rocket. And it goes to the space in a matter of five to 10 minutes, you know, imagine the force of propulsion it's got we are talking about millions of newtons but the issue there is fuel savings in chemical rockets this is a big problem in the real sense because the velocity uh, the chemical velocity is very low 
uh, but there is a midway to it and that midway has to do with nuclear systems the systems that we call nuclear rockets but we call them thermonuclear rockets because there are other types of nuclear rockets and the thermal neck is the mix is in the midway between chemical and the electric rockets so they give us good fuel savings and they give us good propulsion forces and where are they going to be important when in the future if you indeed want to go to mars you can use it in the real sense with human systems you can use it and it's going to be nuclear because there are two factors that are important because fuel systems are important because the amount of fuel is very important in Mars missions and also you need to go fast you know you cannot uh, you don't have the luxury of going there in nine months you need to go there in three to four months and nuclear is going to be there and if I have time I'm going to talk about it the history of rockets I don't want to lose time but it's not that old you know because as you know in the industrial revolution it has started towards the end of it there was a mathematical uh, math Russian mathematics teacher Konstantin Tsirkovsky the museum is still in Ukraine and right now whatever you can think of you know about space what our space agents he talked about what our professors talked about these were you know there is no practice to it but it has been discussed and written theoretically it was towards the 1850s and the beginnings of 1900s but he didn't burn one grams of oxidizing fuels and he has never fired a fuel it was in 1930s, it was the Germans that did it, you know, there was a German scientist, he writes a PhD assertion as to how to reach the space, and imagine the mentality back then, and Obert's PhD thesis was not accepted, they said this is nonsense and you cannot get a PhD but the uh, assertion uh, gave rise to a great book about travel to the space and you know what happened then in germany he be he started an incredible trend because he mobilized the youngsters and they start building rocket clubs and, and for the first time you know Tchaikovsky he didn't fire one oxygen molecule but germans are making real oxygen molecules and firing them. When is Werner von Braun? And in Germany, he started this and he is the founding father of the uh, rocket science and with the push or rather with the pressure of the Nazis, he built a rocket he's the pioneer of the rocket it doesn't change the uh, because what you put on the ballistic missiles is conventional so it doesn't change anything but he changed the history of rocket business because he launched this rocket successfully is with the v2 rocket that is a4 rocket in german that constitutes the foundations of the rockets of the present day so uh, whether you believe it or not we do have and von brown goes to the u.s after uh, the war he goes there with 300 engineers interestingly and the russians uh, they entered the fenaminde that is the area where they built it penaminde and the americans and the russians captured this so starting from 1940s and in the 50s in the 60s they reached their peak point and in the in the u.s and in the soviets the rocket sciences reach Werner uh, von braun is the critical name in the u.s he did the saturn V super heavy lift launch vehicle and the korolev in russia he's also the founding founder of the rush he's a uh, russian scientists and you know rocket business advanced and in end 60s they go to the moon and they have incredible accomplishments but uh, starting from 80s towards the end of 90s rocket activities stop and even let me tell you this if you open the hoods of major rockets the atlas rocket the engine that you will find 
were, were engines that were designed in the 1970s, you know, it's RD 180s. So the advances, the technological advances in rocket activities stop until the beginning of the century. But something happens at the turn of the century, commercial space practices you know it is the technology risk we've got dear friends who found their fortune through the internet they began a rocket league because it turns out it was their hobbies you know they were interested in the you know from elon musk to bezos to paul allen you can list all the names and these individuals they advance and further rocket sciences but how do they do they don't further it from a technology standpoint it's still the same liquid and uh, solid fuel but they advance it from an economy standpoint and they are finding the methods to build them more economically and to make them faster and to reuse the rockets that's important particularly the space it's built uh, by uh, elon musk is of critical importance and let me tell this real fast and uh, towards the end of the second world war i call them the early stage amateur spirit and then it was the state driven strategic activities done with the state pressures and it just died out in the 90s in that level it stopped this is the second phase and the third phase is this exciting phase the commercial space and the objective is profiting and discovering so it's going real fast we can say let me talk about it real fast you know the current station spacex and blue origin you know they are the falcon 9 rocket and rp1 it's it's uh, it's fueled by kerosene it is the nephew of the diesels and they use liquid oxygen and the tech the logical foundations dates back to 1965. The injector technology in, is the same, it's the identical with the one that landed on the moon. Actually, it's a state of the art technology is not around. We don't see that. And Jeff Bezos in the company Blue Origin, liquid oxygen and hydrogen are used, and they use the BE3 engine and they are flying around the orbit. And I'm sure you have heard Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic. He flew himself and that paved the path for space tourists so he is trying to do it with a rocket engine because their objective is to be cost effective that's why they are using hybrid and also it's safe the, but safety is not guaranteed in rocket sciences there is that also and now let us to, after talking about the past and the present let's talk about the future as well because it could be important to see the future i'm going to make an assessment for the next decade liquid oxygen and methane so that is the natural gas again the cousin of the natural gas as you know this is going to be of critical importance and the objective is compared to kerosene methane performs you know the exhaust velocity that's better in methane and the exhaust velocity is lower compared to hydrogen but it's much safer and much simpler so it's cost effective so there's a good average of the two this is how you can think of methane so in that regard both spacex and blue origin have very critical activities and i i'm sure you have heard of starship this is the biggest uh, rocket that has exploded because you know he kept launching and blasting he had a few successful launches but these guys as you know they don't uh, mind about blasts and explosions because there is no other way of doing it and hybrid rockets will be important in the future because you know safety simplicity and cost effectiveness that is the foundations and this is in the this is it's their innate natures and these can be used in launching systems and there are many activities across the world there are tens of companies three or four of them uh, which in germany south korea the u.s there are many important companies and india is about to start the race as well and delta v hybrid rocket delta v is our turkish rocket company which was founded in 2016 and it we have had a lot of 
uh, advances, you know, we could just shoulder the first rocket. It's called Gossar. It was flying uh, uh, with a subsound system. But the source rocket, we have come in three to four, you know, that would crush you, let alone shouldering it. It's 2.5 tons that can go into the space. And it uses liquid oxygen and paraffin. So it uses state-of-the-art technology. And right now, I can tell you clearly, we are one or two years ahead of the world in terms of hybrid technology. And I hope we are going to proceed in this source can reach hypersonic speeds so that is five six seven even eight times faster than the speed of sound and uh, they are going to be launched in a few years but the speed is right now at four to five but they are developing fast and how about the medium future medium term the the thermal nuclear rockets will be in the scene you know you cannot go to mars with human beings you know you need to travel back and forth nine months each and you're going to wait there five months you know that would kill you of radiation i would have preferred dying of radiation rather than being in that claustrophobic area think of the psychological pressures and whatnot so the thermal uh, rockets are very important and the propulsion is very high there the propulsion and ve that is the exhaust velocity that is very high so that's a good combination of the two and thermal nuclear rockets are developed real fast it was developed in 1969 when I was born and that was the Nerva rocket engine, you know, that was in its full-fledged form back then. But these rocket development projects in 1970, 1971, they come to a full stop in the US and the Russia. There is a region because the atmospheric nuclear tests were forbidden because there was a, an agreement that was signed. So as a byproduct of that, the nuclear engines came to an end in terms of development so they couldn't do it and that uses hydrogen as fuel and this is a one-to-one -one scale it has been built and success it tested it's a very successful system but they never found the opportunity to launch it into the space and NASA is working on it private companies including Blue Origin are working on this so this is going to be a big leap forward I can say and how about the long term you know this is you know too much looking into the future and you can't hold me responsible because i won't be around for uh when it's 50 years uh, time but the ve that is the exhaust velocity is very high and fuel savings is important in the first degree primarily because we want to go outside the solar system because you want in order to go to the near speed you need to reach speeds so, of uh, reaching light speed because our mass is increasing and the only way to do it to, to, is to ensure propulsion in a very efficient way. Antimatter, uh, uh, protons, antiprotons, uh, clashes and this antimatter in what kind of a tank will you store it because there is this technology called electromagnetic <coughs> imaging and you need to develop this. That's one. And the second is this exit velocity is endless in certain systems. One is the uh, so space sail there are photons and you're going with a it's, it's a sail of sorts using zero fuel and it has been tested and tried this is possible in the solar system and also uh, certain circles uh, came up with an idea a concept which is called the electromagnetic em drive so with an em way without using any fuels i can propel myself into the space and the theoretical and the physical parts you know i'm talking about it with the physicists and um uh, but such a technology and similar technologies being developed will help people leave the solar systems and to do uh, uh, to take certain actions it might sound like science fiction right now but in the near future maybe it will no longer be science fiction at least there will be the theoretical foundations but perhaps that is uh, the, this uh, Alpha Centurion will see us with this kind of an engine, but it is getting close to metaphysics. I'm not going to take too much of your time with the final assessments. You know, commercial space is very critical. Using green fuels in space is very important, particularly in Delta V, Turkish Delta V. We have those activities as well. And in thermonuclear systems in the near future, in the coming two, 20 years, we will be seeing these frequent systems and the von Braun 
Brown, the founding father of the rocket sciences, says pragmatism is possible always thanks to the efforts of those who dream. So we should tell all our teachers not to stop dreaming, you know, both in here and the lectures at school. It is very critical to dream because had Mr. Von Braun not dreamt of those in the 1930s, uh, he wouldn't be able to build that big rocket in 1942 and reach the moon in 1960s. So if you see the distance covered in such a short period of time, you will see everything that is possible. I would like to show you a few videos. So at least, you know, with the rocket firing videos, let's enjoy the morning. Will you be able to help me? Let's uh, go with the countdown. The first video is delta v these are the rocket firing videos and uh, there is a vertical firing using liquid oxygen and paraffin it's a vertical firing test we did a lot of these and one of these tests uh, is presented to you with a partial video and this is going to give you about the water cooling there's vertical firing so you see how it is in flight What you see, this whitish cloud, we come up with a, this, this creates a cloud and it's not the toxic gases rather, it's the water vapor. It is the evaporation because that is what protects the concrete underneath. Had in, because it's 3000 Kelvin, no concrete can withstand. So you're preserving, protecting the uh, concrete by spraying water and this has been successfully fired numerous times. And the next video is, uh, is a flight video. This has been launched from Sinop. Uh, this is the system that could reach the space and the altitude wise, it has a very high performance. Um, it is uh, that system, the engine of which was tested vertically. It is the launching of that system from Sinop. We have a problem about our country, which is our, we don't have launching systems. We are launching towards the Black Sea, but we cannot launch it beyond a certain angle because there is still not behind you. And if you launch it downwards, you got not Ukraine, but the other side. So there are other countries around. So Black Sea is not enough. And us and Roketsan and everyone else who wants to do it is a problem, has a problem. So the space agency department needs to build a spaceport with other countries. And our space agency's number one objective, as our uh, president said, is the lunar project. So the hybrid engine is being developed by the Delta V company. We fired it a lot and technology wise, we're quite ready. So uh, from a configuration standpoint, this is not going to fly per se, but this is very similar to the, so this is one of the tests of the system that is almost identical from a con configuration standpoint. Now we will be watching it. As I said, because this is a space engine, it's using low propelling force because this is what's desired. It's burning for longer periods. It's going to burn for hundreds of seconds because it has, we have gone up to 80 or 100 seconds. And uh, so there is no technological obstacles in terms of reaching it in many hundreds of seconds. And we are doing it in the Delta V facility. So technology wise, we are ready. And why are we doing this? Because the objective is not to build the engine that is going to take Turkey on a lunar mission because as when we were formulating it with our chairman the objective is to build a cost-effective and simple system that we can sell to the rest of the world and to make it uh, qualified for space so that our country has a place in that table as well going to the moon is good but being able to sell to the rest of the world the engine that can take us to the moon will give us a better say in this table thank you very much for this for your patience and if you've got any questions, I would love to take them. And of course, if we do have time, we run out of time, but we will accept one question. We are out of time, but still we can have one question. If you are thinking of manned uh, flights, uh, then I can give you a couple of names uh, to go with the rockets. So one of our technicians so entered the zone we, uh, we call North Cone, and he was trying to do some things. And, and, I, and I said, we are ready to launch people, so uh, uh, if we can do this. 
Uh, and I said, Jenna, should I uh, should I t send you to the moon? And he was he was scared and he he ran. So that's why we're not ready for this yet. Thank you very much. I was meaning to ask. Uh, this is inaudible. So this is uh, the question is inaudible to the interpreters because the uh, the person who is asking the question is not using a microphone. Sorry for this inconvenience. Ben size çok tatmayacak bir cevap vereceğim. Son I'll, okay, I'll It has, it doesn't have to be object oriented. You say that only the detector will go and it will face uh, so we know uh, where it will be facing based on coordinates. So we take you out and we separate detach you uh, from the rocket and then you become a beneficial lord and if it's a space study you can have state tracker and if you want micro uh, microgravity you do something else then and depending on how many minutes we can s uh, we can uh, stay outside the space so we have a technology available in the hands of the Republic of Turkey and also we are talking to some users abroad as well and we have a couple of uh, customers uh, so we cannot make these launches from Turkey uh, due to certain problems but we can do it and, and so uh, we will become one of the most developed countries in the world uh, about Uh, sounding rockets, thank you very much. I'm from Turkshat, satellite uh, te uh, telecommunication. So I'm the uh, manager of the 5G projects as well. I have a very technical question, but based on some basic cases. In Turkshat, so we have an electrical thrust system and we, we launched 19. It has reached orbit only last week and then it had a long journey but in, in the fourth and sixth uh, generation national satellites, we have a chemical system and we were able to commission them right after launching. This is a, uh, this is a very important criterion for us uh, for in order to calculate the economic value of, of the satellite as well. Uh, but in electronic thrust ones, we have to wait for five, six months and you've been working with these technologies uh, for, for many years. You're a very valuable professor working in this field. In the law, in the short term, do you think uh, uh, the uh, the time needed for these electric uh, electro, uh, electric truss systems to reach orbit can be a uh, shortened? And uh, let me congratulate you first and foremost. And I was part of. So we weren't present in the launching, but we were together in those groups, and we are so pleased to see all this uh, on behalf of Turkey, for Turkey. The, the biggest problems about the electric thrust systems is the uh, impulsion uh, propulsion rate. So the, uh, so the ion engines are very bad. Uh, so, uh, so the first topic that I worked on uh, uh, as I was graduating from Istanbul Technical University, monoplasma dynamic thrusters. So Mazur private uh, trusses have an advantage, so they have a higher level of trust. Uh, from millinewton levels, to you can go to uh, tens, twenties, or hundreds of newtons as well. That's by maybe not in the short term, but we, maybe within a decade we can have a we can have magnetic uh, we can have some system using ma magnetic area, and maybe we can reduce our transfer time from five or six months to a single month. But we, it can never go down to the level of chemical rockets. Uh, the technological challenges here are persisting, so the cutout erosion is, is, uh, remains to be the biggest problem. Maybe Turkey should penetrate into this field. May, maybe we should be making that uh, engine. This is inaudible. As Turksat, uh, the, there is a commercial. Uh, this is a commercial need for us, not only for Turksat. And, and I think it's a general need of um, rocket uh, op uh, operators. So uh, wait, uh, having to wait for another five, six months after launching the, uh, the rocket has um, a negative uh, impact. Or, um, so this is a fundamental factor. 
so uh, we, uh, we have used the, electron, uh, the, the electric uh, trust uh, system for the first time, and we're so happy and proud to have done this. It has some uh, there are some technical disadvantages to it. There's sometimes there's an urgent need for rocket because technology is changing very rapidly, and uh, so the the possibility of them of our mobile phones ha uh, have the, uh, the risk of uh, becoming out of date within five or six months. Um, uh, yes, I, I've noted this down, and then uh, we'll try to do this work more pressingly as well, and then uh, and hopefully we'll be producing these solutions in Turkey. And so our next speaker uh, after Arif Bey, so we have Professor Emrah Kalemci of uh, Sabancı uh, University, and then the title of presentation is Science with Small Satellites. Can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah. So the title of my presentation is uh, Science with Small Satellites. I'll be mainly making reference to CubeSats and in astronomy and astrophysics. And many scientific studies may be weight, uh, made using this uh, CubeSats in these fields. And I'll be talking about my own field. And I'll try to tell you about the studies which are made in Turkey or those studies which can be made in the future. Most of my slides are in English. I'm sorry for it. I apologize for this, but my speech will be in Turkish. And also, I'd like to thank you very much for, your, uh, for inviting me to such a symposium and for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to extend my thanks to the organizers. I will kind of ask you to, uh, to complete your presentation in 15 minutes. So, uh, so this appeared in Nature Astronomy a couple, of, uh, three or four years ago. This is a picture from there. Uh, so these small satellites and so uh, nano, so cube satellites from uh, X uh, rays to gamma rays, and so uh, all of these are using cube satellite systems and uh, and also uh, and this this can revolutionize astronomy in the world because these CubeSats are relatively cheaper and also they make it easier uh, to reach uh, the state, uh, to reach space. And those uh, countries or, or organizations which haven't had this opportunity before can take their technologies further and also, so if you talk about what a cube satellite is, and so, so they have a standard deployer or pod and then, and so they uh, are uh, they are fully functional and they can fulfill all the functions of a satellite. So they uh, so, so uh, a, a standard unit satellite is ten. So ten, so it's a small thing. It is ten centimeter. Uh, so it's a ten centimeter cube, and also its weight is about one point four kilograms. However, these cube satellites as can be 2U or 3U, and it, can, it, it may be l longer, uh, it may be made longer, and which will, this, this renders them more functional, and 6 and 12U models have uh, started to emerge as well as the size gets bigger, and so the energy uh, that, that it can collect also increases as well, and so this also increases their functions uh, uh, in response, uh, as well, so those working in astronomy would know this well. In astronomy, size really matters. So the size of mirrors and also detector size, and also the detector, uh, the size of detector array is important as well. Uh, so what we can do with the uh, cube, uh, cube satellites is really very limited. So except I'm Newton, so for example, this is an X-ray satellite of NASA, and also, so, so you see a uh, cube satellite in the same size. So. Uh, a cube satellite is a tiny thing, but as so, if it's designed for a single purpose, then and you can achieve great results because in larger satellites, and because they have to appeal to many people, there's a high demand for them, and also uh, having a half-day observation time is very difficult in these large satellites. 
Um, but when you implement, uh, you can implement your own idea and you can send a cube satellite to space. And you, you can have a chance to do things uh, through uh, which you cannot do using these larger satellites. And so I'll tell you some. Uh, I'll tell you about some cube sets that are planned in optical astronomy. But I won't be going into much technical detail. And the first thing that I'd like to tell about uh, the the first uh, satellite thing that I'd like to tell you about is uh, Bright. And so uh, this is a cooperation between Australia, um, Poland, and Canada. And so this is a consortium. And so it is not co uh, a. It is 20 by 20, uh, but you see the number of publications made uh, with this uh, satellite systems. They are increasing very rapidly, and it's a very successful project. And today, as you can see, it's about a stellar va uh, variability of bright stars or long time observation of this bright star. For example, you cannot use a big a big telescope or a big satellite system to observe these bright stars because at the time of these are very uh, valuable and because you have to give this time to many astronomers and uh, so you can uh, conduct these studies only through some private satellite systems and also this uh, so this was uh, this satellite was created to make uh, so this is uh, this is about this for the identification of the planets uh, around bright uh, stars and we are, I'm talking about bright all the time because these uh, satellites are so small, they can only you can only study some very bright um, celestial uh, bodies using these satellites. It's very important to know this restriction. So this is in infrared, and and so uh, you can uh, so the another satellite made to work uh, bright stars and also and. Um, this is for, and also, and um, this satellite was made to to work this spectrum of bright lights as well. And in order to make a very good scientific study, you need a minimum of six U's. And with three U systems, you can conduct very good scientific studies as well. But as you go higher to six U and twelve U, and the quality of the work that you can carry out increases uh, as well in p uh, parallel to this. And so if we go from optical to UV and X-ray, so X-rays is my field of study, and the same is valid in X-rays as well. And so so as uh, terrestrial telescopes cannot be used, used to study with X-rays, and it is very difficult to get some study time from these telescopes. and. And uh, if you want to look at the bright stars uh, for a long time, and if you want to take a look at X-rays, then y you can uh, use a smaller satellite uh, to this end. So I'd like to give you a couple of examples again. So this is uh, uh, about uh, the cosmic uh, X-ray background. So it's a two, uh, it's a two U uh, satellites, and so this is a system. As you can see, there's a it has a collimator. And also, this a uh, uh, somewhat developed version of it. And also, there are some, you can. It is possible to try some new things. For example, the collimator here, for example, uh, it is restricts the uh, uh, so um, area of side of this. Uh, and one of the most important advantages of these cube sta uh, satellites uh, is you can, for example, uh, test some uh, commercial products. Uh, for example. Uh, you don't necessarily have to develop everything, and so you don't have to develop this. For example, these are commercially available. Uh, for example, this collimator can, and uh, you can have a company produce it for you, and and uh, and it becomes much cheaper. Of course, this increases the risk. However, these cube satellites can be sent uh, to space in order to, in order to conduct some trials, and also this is another one where, uh, working at very low X rays. And it was made at the University of Iowa, and uh, so uh, so uh, this was made in order to observe the gamma lights in atmosphere. I'm skipping this, and this uh, this is an interesting one. This was made in order to observe the sun in X-rays. Mean axis one and mean axis two. They were made uh, in at Colorado University. There are three U, and also commercial X-ray detectors were used. 
and in order to observe this uh, solar explosions and especially in low x-rays uh, you can collect um, a great uh, amount of data and uh, this is a bit harder in high uh, rays so when it comes to hard x-rays in and so when we look at some gamma ray related or, or oriented cube systems so gamma ray explosions can be uh, can be studied very well using this cubes uh, so they can be very bright because at, uh, and they may come from any direction at any time that's why you don't have to and instead of uh, turning uh, the, the satellites to a certain direction and making observation for a time, having multiple satellites uh, is more advantageous and you can identify the lo location as well. There are many cube uh, satellite projects in order to observe these gamma light explosions. And uh, so this is from the surface of the moon. And so there's a X-ray uh, telescope and so uh, this study was made in order to understand the characteristics of certain materials. So this is again a 6U system. So these are, um, so there's a list of gamma and X-ray systems to be made in the future. What really matters to us? Uh, this is Sarja Satfan. Rustam Bey will be touching upon it, uh, I believe, in his presentation. It's in UA, so it is made in the it is being uh, produced uh, in co uh, as a cooperation of Sabah University and Islamic Technical University. There is a hard X-ray detector on it, and it is uh, it is being produced for, uh, for United Arab Emirates, and uh, in order to have some long-term uh, observations, it will be launched uh, shortly. I have a couple of slides about this, which I'll be showing in a moment. And so you see uh, various uh, ray ray uh, uh, lengths and this shows where we're going uh, and most of the pro most projects are delayed due to the pandemic but it, when it comes to uh, gamma light explosions and also the the observation of black spots uh, black holes uh, in 2025 uh, there will be uh, quite a few cube satellites working and so for a few minutes i'd like to tell you about this charge sat uh, a minute ago, uh, Ari Bey said, "If you have a if you have beneficial load, load, then uh, we will find, we will put it on the sounding uh, rocket. So we have an X-ray det detector that we are using in the satellite, mm -hmm. and and we, uh, so and so they can be identified using some sounding rockets as well. And so this detector system is a three U, and it is being tested at the moment. I won't go into this technical detail, but main my objective." Mm -hmm. And so their technical life is not very important. So these are the tests of the flying model. And as you see the spectrums that we take, that we obtain, I'll tell you about two things. Who is making this satellite? And so, the, and so the, this is about a publication that we're about to publish. And so you see the name of the authors. The one in yellow uh, are masters and PhD students. And the ones in green or blue are bachelor's degree uh, students. So these uh, cube satellite systems as, uh, can be used in order to train some human resources as well, and and and it is making a great uh, contributions in order to create detectors to work in space as well, and as you know that there are some black hole, uh, so uh, these are used. For, uh, so a uh, long-term observation of black holes is being planned and uh, with this uh, satellite it is possible to observe the, the sun as well however in very hard x-rays i'm not sure whether we'll be able to see anything from the sun or not but at least we can try we can try using this system and last of all i'll tell you about a somewhat larger satellite system from nano satellites and from 10 centimeter to centimeter, maybe if we talk about a, a larger system of, a, for example, 100 kilos, let me tell you about what we can do using such a system. And so, so this, uh, there was a preliminary work that this, uh, the Turkish uh, Space Agency asked astronomers to conduct as a high energy astrophysics uh, group in Turkey. And we conducted a, a, a simple preliminary work, and we called it HASAT, which is similar to harvest. 
and Rasat is uh, one of the first satellites made by Turkey. And then if we had a satellite of similar size, and maybe we could have, for example, installed a hard uh, X-ray detector that was produced in Turkey, and and maybe we uh, we can. Uh, so we believe that we can conduct very good scientific works or studies using the satellites. And I must also say that uh, almost, uh, so almost all, so we can produce uh, these hard X-ray detectors uh, almost in its entirety. So it is detector material. So this crystal is enlarged in uh, Istanbul Technical University and all the preliminary, preliminary work, uh, processes can be conducted and the pixels are and set on it and, and also the connections are made with electronic circuits and also the electronic uh, reading uh, so that the design of the electro uh, electronic reading circuits can be produced in Turkey as a chip to sit on these detectors. That's why so we, uh, and so we can call it a domestic and national from A to Z. Uh, so we can produce a detector system which is 100% domestic. In Turkey, this reset type satellites can easily be produced in Turkey. And I think, so this uh, has to do with the sequencing uh, or, or the ordering of the space agency. And Turkey, uh, I'm sure, will have a scientific uh, satellite working in and the space in space in the future. So we have the scientific know-how and needed for that. In conclusion, I'd like to say that club sats and can be used for some very special, uh, uh, for example, goals from a scientific point of view. And this ensures access to space for many countries and also organizations as well or companies as well. And Turkey is also engaged in similar studies as well. Charge us that although it's a satellite for the United Arab Emirates, it's being produced in Turkey, and hopefully it will start a, it will start operating at by the end of this year, and then it is possible to make some larger satellites for astronomic purposes in Turkey. Uh, thank you very much. Emrah Kalem. Thank you, Mr. Emrah Kalemci. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much, Emra. And we wish you success in your studies. And the last two speakers will be joining online in the symposium. Professor uh, Alim Rüstem Aslan is coming from Istanbul Technical University and he will have a presentation on small satellites. Yes, sir. Hi and thank you. I would have loved to be there physically, but I I flew in from overseas last night, quite late at night. So even if I don't enjoy doing it, I'm going to deliver my presentation remotely. I have also prepared a nice uh, presentation and for you, and I would like to thank you for inviting me in this beautiful organization and you to asked me about the development of small satellites and the relevant stages and within this scope i have i'm going to continue my speech uh, and i also want to set this uh, for the record, we've got two labs in ITU, and since the year 2005, we're working on cube satellites and small satellites. And uh, <coughs> these are my colleagues. Uh, Egemen is a master's degree student, but we've got many. He's not a master's student, but we've got many master's students. And this is the space systems lab where we do the designs and tests. And the, uh, the first thermal care system is in Turkey is here. And we've got uh, Professor, uh, just like Professor Emrah said, we're working with groups from Turkey and overseas. And we also have a book we prepared to, uh, under the umbrella of Turksat. And in the third chapter, uh, we will be focusing on the subsystems. And uh, 
it will be useful to read it. <clears throat> I'm a member of the uh, uh, Will I Academy and uh, good books were written uh, and these are the, uh, it, it would be useful to read them. Uh, and there's a small, uh, we have a NATO meeting uh, uh, for small satellites and this is the what can be the most developed ones and this is a project that has been carried out for one year <clears throat> the satellites that we built professor Emrash Emrash showed the first satellite that we built we have completed six satellites and sent into orbit but the projects we have are the export projects, like Professor Emra has mentioned. Within A2, building a satellite, testing it and preparing it to the space is possible with the infrastructure. Of course, all systems got their problems, but the campus, uh, you can prepare a, satell uh, a satellite without going elsewhere and this is our first satellite we are in 2022 it's still sending signals it's still operational and like i will mention soon satellite is not anything on its own and professor arif talked about it real well rockets are important and turksat uh, satellite operational area uh, all of these need to be used. The satellites consist of various subsystems and they can change depending on their missions and tasks. But I'm going to talk about this TurkSat 3 and this is the X-ray detectors first activities that we did with EMRA. This is the QB50 project, two satellites that we did with EMRA. And also the <coughs> air. We worked with Mr. Aksa uh, in the former version of the space agency in Turkey, Ubakusat. This is in the Japanese Space Center. And the Aselsan satellite, there are many activities and many talents were uh, uh, drawn. And Emrah talked about it. I don't want to go too deep, but when you're designing a satellite, you begin with a task. There are certain uh, space uh, uh, missions. Uh, and then the operational concept of the satellite needs to be considered because when you're designing it, the mission of the satellite, what it will do, what kind of processes it will go through. At point zero, you need to think of this. You need to put it on the table because if you want to improve and develop a successful project. And here, I particularly want to include this. This is the Sharjah Sat 1. And this is the finance was mostly came with Sharjah Sat, but Etu and Sabanji, you know, the satellite was being built in Turkey, but this is a great cooperation, and I believe that this is going to give rise to new projects. So the first satellite or satellite components were imported, were exported from Turkey. And when you're developing a satellite, there are many processes drawing the satellite, making the information analysis, the thermal and structural. I just wanted to include this. And you see the Sharjah Sat 1 satellite on the table. Many uh, local uh, entities' contributions are here. And when you compile them, this assembles the satellite uh, on the corner of a table, as you can see. So these small satellites have this interesting aspect to them. There's the vibration test, there are several tests, and they have been all done in Istanbul Technical University campuses, in Sabanja labs also. There are great activities that are being done, and I hope that we, I believe that we will continue. And the, the, the, we started a new project that is 16U in a size, and there's the camera, and the resolution is... 1.5 meters and it's 25 kilograms and the budget is not that bad 
you know, this is a notch lower than the bigger satellites, although the capabilities are similar. And because we are a university research laboratory, any project that we do is pushing the boundaries because we don't have any uh, commercial activities, even though we work with many commercial entities. We're not building the cameras, but I hope that it will be done soon because the camera capabilities are developed. This is the preliminary design work and we have started the project and these uh, oh, oh, panels that can open and we're working with MAM, uh, the research center. And I hope the Gaziantep University cells will be used because this is going to ease our hand. <coughs> And also, there are DISH satellites, S1, DISC1, and this is being done in a low-cost way, and this is very important. And also with the space agency, we, there is a satellite development for the UME, and this is at the contract stage, if that is sized. And also, you, these are the uh, observation satellites and uh, satellite teams. These are quite important. They have high added value and we need to do it. This is the one kilo comparison. The gentleman is not audible because of the video. I apologize. He's not audible. Of course, uh, why are we doing all these studies? Because uh, the future is in the space and we need to be ready for the future and small satellites as it has been discussed are in they can be delivered in very brief periods with quite reasonable prices but you're undertaking and accepting certain risks so in line with those risks there's a process there's a development there's a set of experiences so that you can attain success with the same cost and what matters is using them together as a team satellite concept and the, you, there are different uh, satellites and examples of configuration up to 16 units and there are certain drawings they are not standard but they are references and they need to be used <coughs> small satellites are sent inside the pond and this is uh, forcing your hand uh, in terms of design and you see the codes and you see the orbit deployers this is an animation <clears throat> there are different uh, the pods used by different satellites are various and because their energy needs are uh, <clears throat> high we've got retractable solar panels and this is how we come up with the new design and their advantage is, it, it, and ours, Etusat-1, is not Turkey's first satellite, but it's the first satellite that was built in Turkey. And let me talk about the space system, because the space section does not constitute an activity on its own, and uh, taking it to the orbit with orbits, Arif's uh, rockets, and the, uh, you have to turn it into a system with the land section and the space section the effects of an orbit is important we call this the control and command communication architecture the mission brings them all together and we need to use it in an optimum way and this is a mission critical effort i'm not going to go into that and when we look at the work breakdown structure you have the ground st station and the space station and uh, as an example here i wanted to include a cube uh, satellites because there is no effect system the new uh, cube systems also have effect systems and uh, this shows it in Turkish but I'm going to wrap up my speech in a matter of few sec minutes and when you carefully look on, on this page when in order to develop and design a satellite what you need to be careful about is when you're beginning the project you need to know what your mission is what the situation on earth is and what your budget is 
and what are the capabilities of you and your country and what you need to be focusing on you need to know them up front and if you don't know them in the course of the project your project uh, could end up on in the lab or the table and not go further so who wants to do the project and what for and uh, you are going to be faced with certain political restrictions and you're going to have a budget restriction and the minute you begin the project you need to be in communication and you need frequency supplies and to get that frequency you need to know with which frequencies or in which frequencies you will work and then you'll have technical capabilities or incapabilities and uh, if you're uh, facing if you are willing to accept working on earth you can send anything on orbit so international relations as it was mentioned in the first speech by mr ibrahim this is very important because you know international relations are indispensable in the space arena and what kind of a performance uh, you want from your satellite requires paying attention to certain conditions you know for how long will you operate it or if it's an imaging satellite or if it's a communication satellite with which locations will it be in communication you need to be taken into account such parameters and prepare your design and for cube satellites there is the uh, code restrictions uh, the volume that you receive the mass distribution and there's a launching duration of the orbit you're entering and as well as the orbit that you will be in when at space will bring you certain restrictions and your design needs to take that into account as well and you will need an electricity power requirement and in the systems inside and outside the satellite and how that will be positioned as well as the operational period of the satellite if you're not careful about such things once the satellite is over it's going to be a system that is useless and that can operate only under certain conditions you will have learned many things because every study every effort teaches you something but to be to place yourself in the orbit you will need to work for quite some time or you your activities might stop altogether if you don't have the budget and along with the frequency station you need to think of the infrastructure of the ground station and the capabilities and the budget of the ground station once you take that into account, perhaps you will need to design your satellite accordingly because as the frequencies go higher, the cost also increases, you know. It can also multiply, it can, it, there are six or seven subsystems and you need to uh, identify the requirements and make the designs and this is important when you're choosing your satellites no one builds big satellites because a project period of more than 10 years because the project that you have started will be obsolete because technology changes real fast <laughs> you might as well not start and there are satellite technologies that are lighter than one kilogram so in the future with cube satellites or small satellites we used to question ourselves what to do with them and now you could be asking what could they be doing with the uh, satellites less, uh, lighter than one kilos but they could be an important gain in the future you show the general uh, structure and architecture and this is the cube the functional block diagram and the relation of between the subsystems how you distribute the system and how you communicate the data once you draw the, this chart it means you're ready to build your satellite we use PC-104 connector and we are trying to deviate from this but you know the commercial concerns might provide us and once you have created the pin diagram and if it's running smoothly it means your satellite is ready for the design as well <coughs> and there are certain model studies so when you look at it if you're very experienced, so just like we are doing right now, you could start the satellite that could be launched into the space. Or if you're not experienced, or if you're working on a new code, you need to work with labs or 
with the, you need to verify certain concepts with desktop models or with an engineering model or engineering competency model you need to prove that the satellite is ready and you need to send it uh, with the launch mode and you need to start the software on day one if you leave the software you will experience problems when your satellite is finished so the development process needs to be you know you see the conceptual design desktop engineering flight and rather we started doing proto flight models and this is the classical engineering systems process of the of nasa and we do see this in the life cycle of a project development but it would be different for a big satellite and in another way different for the cube satellites you need to prepare many documents and it's indispensable it's very important you mustn't avoid preparing documents because of being understaffed and uh, overworked we are uh, experiencing problems in terms of documents but you definitely need to prepare them you mustn't avoid them it's of critical importance and also when you're building a um, satellite we've got design drivers and this includes mass, power consumption, cost, schedule, lifetime, and the reliability of the system. Because if you have a propulsion system, the speed is important and also the orbit that you're working. These are the main drivers and there are also mission load related parameters as well. And let me finish it this way. If you don't have a budget, because it's not cheap to build a budget, you know, you could, you have uh, the, the the beginning point is one million dollars, which is very high for us. But you can go for model satellites. You can try many things with model satellites for real cheap. I have shown the prices here in dollars for nine hundred dollars between one hundred to nine hundred dollars. You could do a very complicated system, and one thousand dollars is not a small figure either. We're giving training courses in Turkey and across the world and uh, there are many instructors who say they're working on space with no experience. I recommend that they build model sat satellites. Ah, one more thing. October 17 to 21, we have is Nano, the 11th Nano Satellite Symposium and we're working for your abstracts and for your attendance. You can directly send them to me. Thank you very much. Professor Dr. Alim Rüstem Asunut. We would like to thank our speaker very much. Are there any questions or contribute comments? Okay, thank you once again. The last speaker of this session is Dr. Onur Keskin of Işık University and he was talking about optomedical systems and their applications in space technologies. He's in our room now. The floor is yours. I think you can hear me. So you, th you have 15 minutes. First and foremost, so if you look at what optom mechatronic systems are, so this has to do with software and electronics, and we, we know that they cons uh, they are they're composed of mechanics, software, and electronics as well. But I think optics must be involved at a certain point as well. Uh, this the, the the simplest made uh, uh, example that we can provide is a. a a East uh, uh, Eastern Anatolia Observatory Telescope. So when we when you look at a regular optic system, uh, and when you look at a, a passive telescope or a, a probe, so what really matters here is, uh, is to be uh, is the ability of understanding what's happening inside, and also you being able to use the remote sensing abilities, and also. Uh, compensating these with some software, and I think the uh, the the, uh, the biggest character, uh, the most important characteristic of this telescope, is that it doesn't only observe, but uh, while observing, and uh, we are talking about the thinnest uh, mirror of, of the world, but uh, it weighs more than four tons. This mirror, as the telescope, and and as the telescope and this mirror are, and tilting. As you can see, 
the, uh, the pistols at the bottom, and there are some latches on the sides as well with, uh, with an active optical system. Uh, uh, uh, all types of moments, and also uh, uh, and also the atmospheric impacts, and also and um, and also light brightness, and using the signals coming from the stars they are observing. This telescope can uh, make measurements once every second, and also. Uh, it positions as uh, it can bring its uh, four meter uh, mirror to the required position. So this is the first example of an optom um, um, uh, metatronic. So, um, so this is a system that was produced by Italian and also Belgian uh, companies. And also we have some systems that we produce in our laboratories as well. So these are adaptive optical systems and also the, uh, the, rotator, system, the rotator systems. Uh, so the, you see Neptune on the right uh, uh, top side. When you look at Neptune with a telescope, you see it as a, uh, as a loop uh, balloon. So the Voyager satellite that you, you see in the middle, so it is in orbit. Uh, it has a very small camera and at the bottom you see the Eastern Anatolia uh, observer, so y you can see the resolution is better than that of Voyager satellite. So when you design a system, and so astrophysicists and also astronomers would know that, so the diameters and the, uh, the as, as dimensions are always very important, and if you double the, for example, diameter of an optical system, then you can, and um, collect four times more light, and this would also increase your resolution as well. So I, I, I East Anatolian ob, uh, Observatory has such an advantage. And also, let's make a comparison. So the James Webb Telescope, it's a $10 billion project. And the Hubble project, and it's a $1.5 billion project. And so it is a, a, a yearly maintenance is known to be $750,000. And also for 20 years, the telescope is, uh, has, is continuing to service. Uh, when you think about these telescopes, uh, the fact that this telescope, uh, this telescope costs uh, about 50 million with, uh, with all its uh, components, in, and I think that the, the perf uh, it is important to show this performance output to show the effectiveness of these systems as well. Troya was uh, produced in Turkey so as a Turkish adaptive optic system for infrared astronomy. And this system, and uh, I'm telling this for those who are not astronomers, when you look at the sky, for example, in the evening when you're sitting by the beach or by, uh, by the coast, and you see the light and the romantic uh, effects, but these are unwanted things for us because and uh, because this shows us the turbulence and this shows how uh, uh, how much it blurs things and uh, the cell impact of blurring as well so these adaptive optical systems optic systems so as big as my nail and uh, so so they are they're 1.5 centimeters uh, square centimeters at least this system and there are 468 pistons and it can change the surface shape of the mirror and uh, it eliminates all this uh, all the impacts of the turbulence and also it, it's a uh, functions and if the, t the telescope was working in space and it also makes it possible to obtain very high resolution images so uh, for the south so it was produced for the telescope in the southeastern observatory telescope and also, we also tested it. I'm sure the astronomers would also evaluate this as well. And I'll show you a couple of pictures. It, uh, they are incredibly sensitive systems, but when we look at the background of it, uh, there is high quality of FHC cameras. And also, there are some remote sensing systems. And also, there's, we are talking about 468 uh, pintons. And so, uh, 468 times 468 uh, matrix is activated every second. And so the physical uh, structure of the mirror can change 1,000 times a second. So you can uh, change it completely. So we conjugate it. And so you have a very clear uh, image as if you'd send it to space. So it's a Troy system. So it's the installed version. 
So it's the laboratory version. Why? Because uh, so I'll start with this new. Uh, you, so you see a laser. Uh, so the the laser goes through a turbul uh, atmospheric turbulence regulator. So there are no rain effects. So when it, r r it rains or snows, the telescopes won't work. So you are all. You are managing the optical impact, uh, and also you see the electric unit of the M468, which can change the surface structure. And also on the on the on the right hand side, you see the open loop. So, and and you see how fragmented the center is, and. So I'll show an example in the video as well, and, we will, and so you can bring it together, and you can bring it down to a single pixel. And so if you ask me what is diffraction patterns are, uh, so that uh, so the decoic filters hadn't arrived from France, so that uh, instead of using of thousands of uh, euros worth mirrors, we only use some uh, uh, ten euro worth lenses uh, that we use for correction. And uh, the narrator systems are being, have been produced by ourselves as well, and they've also been tested. And so in a, in a telescope line system, the telescope you know, goes up and also turns right and left in order to follow or track something. The, the object it is uh, following or tracking has an orbit itself, and the world is revolving as well. So when astronomers are making some long-time observations, the picture they obtain is a, is a series of superposed images. And uh, so in the uh, DR system of the in Star uh, in Star Trek movie and also in some documentaries. So and also the world and also stars uh, should be a point like, but they are uh, they appear elliptical. So the derivator the, the, uh, the systems with the, uh, with the data they receive from the uh, encoders of these telescopes. And uh, they uh, move uh, reversely in in the in the opposite direction, and you can collect uh, you can obtain an image as it should be. It can be it was designed to be uh, um, integrated uh, to the telescope. Uh, so the uh, South Eastern Anatolian Telescope is a novelty in many uh, many areas. We have some patent applications for this as well, which are still under assessment. What will this provide us with? And in the in the picture in the left bottom, and you see a halo area, which is blue. And uh, so, so for example, this is a four meter telescope. So it's a simulation example. There is nothing you can do. So you can see it as a dark area uh, or as a halo area with nothing inside it. And also within the blue area, so when you, when you also operate the adaptive, adaptive uh, optical system, then you can see, you see that there are uh, hundreds of stars or some uh, space objects as well. Uh, so, so the part which is shown in green and blue, uh, so that area is not hollow and it's not empty, but it shows that only we have some insufficient resolution and also the effects of uh, turbulence. Uh, is making it impossible for us to make this imaging and with the adaptive systems very eliminating this problem as well. And on the right uh, top side, so you see the equipment to be put in that, and you, so you see a kernel graffer, and so they are all meta uh, me me mechatronic systems. And on the left hand side, uh, so you see the near infrared camera too, and it can make observation up to two newton, uh, three micron. The, uh, the, the most, so an uh, art thing, uh, when we compare the one on the right and left, when you, uh, when you see the blurness and also the, uh, the uh, clearness, so you can see when the atmospheric uh, effects are eliminated, you can, say we can, you can see that we can, have, we can obtain very accurate and clear v uh, images as well. What is in this uh, optotronic uh, tr systems? Uh, so we, we are starting to pro make, produce some solutions for some public and private organizations as well. And uh, from satellite, as, so this is for communication from Earth to satellites and also inter-satellites as well. These projects are being supported by the, United, uh, uh, by the European Enid as well. So they have very low bit error rate and also their coupling efficiency is very high. And then, uh, so we can provide this in-house, uh, and also we have pro we have produced some test devices, and we tested them into Vitac. And 
uh, uh, so one of the things that Ibrahim uh, Bey talked about, what's happening up in the sky? or So it's not only astronomic objects, so there can be some maybe meteors, and also there are some man-made devices as well, and uh, there, uh, there are more than 300,000 objects, man-made objects in this, in, the, in, this, in space, and also they collide with satellites, and also they may harm to the satellites as well. And then, and, uh, and you'd like to see what is passing, for example, um, above you, over you, and also uh, with, this, with the studies here, with a, with a telescope with a diameter of 2.5 meters, you will see the real pictures on the left-hand side. So the images of uh, 2.5 me uh, meter telescopes are blurred most of the time. When you go to 10 centimeters, you need to enlarge the diameter of the telescopes because once you enlarge them, you can collect more light and we can go deeper and we can have higher resolution as well. So, so after once we make the, their uh, adaptive uh, correction, we begin to see the shape and we, we use certain methods as well. We get very close to the real image. So we can have a resolution of up to 93%. <laughs> And so this is, and, and also this also uh, includes SSA practice as well. So so this can be used in order to observe our own satellites to see what they are doing. So it provides you with many possibilities. And also uh, another another a couple of examples that we can pr produce in house that we can focus in a couple of different places simultaneously. And. Uh, so, so just like you can fix the image of a star, so, so there is a, a communication laser, and also with high resolution uh, laser, you can use it in uh, the defense area as well. So the core area of the laser can be fixed hundreds of kilometers from uh, away, and uh, this slide uh, tries to show the advantages of doing so. I think I, I believe I'm finishing on time. So, uh, so these are some examples of our engineering design capabilities, and these are our co cooperations. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions you may have. Doctor Öğretim Üyesi. I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Onur Keskin and um, very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, So in one of the presentations, I said, look what we can do. And so uh, I'm really turning green with envy. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, uh, I've been in this profession for about 32 years. And uh, so we weren't allowed to touch the telescope in the garden. And however, uh, in, at the point that we have reached, um, there are some original, uh, original electromechronic uh, works coming out. I also regard Onu as part of the astronomic uh, community as well. And so these are dreams that we, we could only dream uh, as assistants in a very short span of time. So all these things can materialize now. They, they can become reality. So I'd like to thank each and uh, uh, uh, every colleague uh, who are contributing to this development. So I'd like to thank Onur Bey as well. I wish we were able to, um, uh, so it's an incredible thing, let me put it this way. So it's, it's something incredible from an astronomical point of view. So in our meeting last year, so we were hopeless. So uh, maybe, or, uh, was it only me who was pessimistic or hopeless last year? But the picture we see today is really very pleasing. Is there a certain reason for this? Is this something personal? So let me put it this way. Uh, was it 1994 when uh, Tubitax National Observatory was opened? I think it was around then. It was uh, such a modest study. It was in 1996 or 97. And so it started as a modest, uh, modest initiative, but it was a very important step for Turkey. And when we compare when uh, this Tubitax Observatory started and if you compare it uh, with the point reached by the Southeastern Observatory, there is an incredible difference, and uh, it hasn't been too, it hasn't been so long, and so trust us, and 
those working in fundamental sciences will do incredible things if they cooperate with engineers and we will take enormous steps and we'll do great things. We're not hopeless, just give us the necessary time and also the resources needed. And that's all we want from you. Onur, do you have anything to say at this point? Thank you very much. Then let's take a break. And I think we now deserve lunch. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.
başlıyor. Bak Müjgan'ı Hakan şeyden kurtardı E5'ten. Düşmüş kedi motora girmiş ve düşmüş motordan içeri. Bu kurtardığı gün 3 haftalık. Ayıptı. Allah'ım yüzün güzelliğine bak. Müjgan tam Müjgan bu. Tam yokum. İşte Ay, şimdi 2 yaşında. Kıyamam. Kaç kedi var? 2. Köpekler? 1. 1 kaldı. Şöyle.
リゼロって書くんですけど、うん、それでブレを受けるっていう、ね、ああ、そうですね。うん、それをす,すごい分かりますよ。それがすごい分かりますよ。それはもう、ブルドンですよ。ああ、ブルドンです。ああ、そんなの。本当はこれですよ。じゃあ、ネプチューンとしては楽しみですね。うん、ネプチューンとしては楽しみ。楽しみやりながらやってほしいですね。Ses deneme bir iki, pazartesi salı s.
Sayın dekanlarım, kıymetli konuklar ve sevgili öğrenciler. Distinguished deans and dear colleagues, welcome to the fifth session of the symposium. And Istanbul University's Economy Faculty Academician, Dr. Zeki Dinçer is invited here by on the stage. And now we have distinguished researchers who will be delivering their presentations. Murat, Professor Murat Azaltun, Ismail Tekbaş, Arzu Aktaş, Ayşe Göksu Atasoy, Associate Professor Aşkın İnci Sökmen Alaca, Mr. Mehmet Pirat Olgun, Professor Yüksel Bayraktar, Associate Professor Hilmi Rafet Yuncu, Associate Lecture Professor Lecturer Cansu Yıldırım and Miss Cansu Soylu. I'd leave, like to leave the floor to the chair of the session, Professor Mitat Zeki Dincher. Thank you very much, distinguished dean, dear members of the protocol, dear academics, dear teachers, and welcome all. And I have hereby opened the session, and there are distinguished presenters, and I have no hesitation that we're going to be enjoying their lectures and th this is the method that we will use if you also approve uh, let me give you 15 minutes each and let us continue at the end of 15 minutes and the q a let us leave the q a at the very end and then we'll we're going to have a discussion session and uh, we I would like to request the distinguished presenters to introduce themselves and to tell the topics of their uh, presentations. That will be a warmer atmosphere. So, Professor Murat Azaltun, Ismail Tekbaş, Arzu Aktaş and Ayşe Göksu Aktasak. But I think it's going to be Ms. Arzu Aktaş who will be delivering the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be a beautiful and meaningful uh, symposium and uh, I would like to thank you for inviting us and uh, now why am I thanking you because uh, uh, when there was a space symposium I was dreaming of being a participant only and back then, uh, together with Ismail Tekbaş and uh, Burak Özaltın, we were thinking about conducting a lecture on space uh, accounting. And, you know, people found it weird and they found it crazy. And in the beginning, it was crazy for us. And after we understood that this was a very serious topic, I also embraced it and NASA's space industry and space economy related topics and what it covers uh, were uh, uh, uh, we uh, started working on this where would be a part of this as the uh, accounting academics accounting professionals and what kind of repercussions there would be on the education training and the curricula of the accounting uh, profession and that was interesting because why uh, do we dream about this in this geography and all the dreams coming through and the innovation and why are these limited? Well, we started working on that and in 2019 we submitted a paper in NIDE. Some supported it, some severely criticized it and in the post-pandemic stage <coughs> when we had 43,000, 44,000 satellites launched by SpaceX and the remote, uh, remote connections and remote work all showed what we meant and everyone who criticized us were standing by us and they were encouraging us to continue because back then they said it's premature for Turkey and why are you striving to do it? So from here to there, you know, we were inviting uh, invited as a speaker and that's a big journey and I'm grateful 
uh, for this and uh, as uh, um, my name is Arzu Aktaş okay but I'm a chartered accountant and uh, we have tour mode and test map and I have been working as an instructor on uh, financial accountants and uh, within the scope of Surya and the chartered accountant it's not only space uh, accounting but accounting philosophy and accounting history and the future of accounting and digital lesson related activities are also within our scope and space accounting is one of them and uh, in our paper is called the new dimensions of accounting in the 21st century and let us begin now uh, our concern is uh, we are a piece of sand, but I carry all the troubles of the des desert, as the Rumi says, as Rumi says. And we've got academics in our team, all these developments in the space and in this global space economy, all these developments must uh, be a part of the way establishments do business and their investment areas. It's going to affect their focus and the way of doing business will change and when it changes the main output of accounting that is knowledge knowledge and information and report and the decision makers uh, and the financial statement users uh, for the institution they need to be informed about the outcomes and the soundness of the investments are informed by the accounting information system and we who have embraced this concern uh, as Galileo says give me a point to lean on and a lever uh, as Archimedes says he's looking for a lever to lift to move the world and um, so looking at the space industry and as the academic community how we are going to be uh, affected how the establishments will benefit and how we can contribute the states and our existing uh, practices are they enough are we at the right point so space economy is going to act as a leverage for us and it's going to carry us can it carry us to the level of space um, in from ancient mayan astronomy to galileo we do know that the history of humanity have always uh, wondered about uh, space and the, can the human species live there and this was always the topic of science fiction novels uh, and uh, movies and in the beginning of the 20th century as you know uh, it was under the uh, states uh, you know the US, NASA, Soviets and also China was affected re effective recently Th there were space efforts and space industry was created and uh, with the uh, states leading them and the private companies started to be involved afterwards and the main reason for this is profit there is no company that wants to pro that doesn't want to profit so private companies are involved in such a massive way and their desire to be involved uh, is uh, focusing on how to continue their business in a sustainable way and their costs at which point they start profiting and when they decide to invest where should the right investments be directed in which areas and the revenues and the future cash flows of these investments how to calculate them uh, and uh, whatever area they will cha choose about space industry which uh, includes space tourism space mining you know uh, mining for uh, extracting certain minerals and metals from the moon or asteroids or bringing in chemicals and processing them or traveling to space or building uh, lodging areas there or the China or China saying I'll build a colony in Mars in 2023 so both the states and the companies are acting together or racing at times they are in competition with each other and these are the most important developments and topics of the 21st century and uh, when we say uh, 
uh, will all these technological advances destroy the profession of accounting we say but we've got engineering and lawyers and architects while this is transforming into space accounting is the backbone of establishments and it constitutes all the systems and all the information processes so how can we stay afar from that? That's not possible. So the accounting information systems practices need to be involved in this. So where will it start and how will it accomplish this? So when we first started, the space law related activities encouraged us. And uh, why were they important? Because uh, in this symposium, uh, one of the joint organizers uh, is the uh, law uh, faculty of law faculty of economics and the faculty of astronomy so uh, when it comes to uh, space uh, law let's say there was a crime that was committed which is a case um, an astronaut accessed her bank accounts and transferred money to his own account and how is it to be assessed and based on what law is considered a crime and what's going what's the penalty going to be how will the uh, crime be established and uh, how the sentencing will take place this is something financial which underlies accounting uh, because accounting keeps the records of money wherever money is their accounting is also there and therefore uh, we're in a realm where uh, money is, is in the center and uh, this is no longer space trade is and space economy is no longer under the uh, monopoly of the states and it's in the hands of the companies so wherever there is money accounting cannot be kept outside this so therefore space activities are close uh, how are they going to affect the science and profession of accounting and how important is accounting for sustainable space activities and how will it help them and uh, particularly for the accounting and reporting of economic activities in space can they be solved with the accounting system and the definition of the space eco economic system and the scope we try to identify it from a theoretical standpoint and why did we carry out the study and what was the requirement the assets the uh, company assets uh, that are sent to space their proper identification is necessary when we think of accounting we think of tax section but this is the middle eastern approach and there is a uh, state centric accounting system and the finance perspective and the tax perspective is uh, has developed accounting in this direction but tax is just one of our hats that we are wearing but accounting is necessary for institutions and establishments so wherever there is economy wherever there is trade the information the production the sales processes and all the business model is to be understood from a to z and the information generated there is to be understood so the profits the losses wherever there are shortcomings is uh, going to be captured by the company through accounting information systems and the information to be given to the state is measured this way and if they drew down loans the banks get the the financial reports to know how much of the money they have landed they can retrieve and companies who want to invest let's say but the parties that will want to invest in space industries uh, if they want to get an economic uh, uh, through uh, uh, there are certain activities that will be carried out through economic state organizations and they need to determine the organizations to see whether they are uh, profiting or they are going bankrupt to see their costs their profits and losses uh, the difference between uh, ac tax accounting and close to reality financial reporting and there are different valuation measures that the states uses 
and we need to understand the true value, the fair value, and how is the fair value calculated? Will there be different currencies, different weights, different lengths, kilograms, units, or will there be a space specific currency or different let's say you have a property and you look at the fair value but based on what will you val do the valuation of an asteroid or in the balance sheet how are you going to include it in the assets or the satellite debris you know when you're launching the satellites into the space or the orbit there is some serious debris accumulation so from a sustainability standpoint when there is space debris what kind of uh, sanctions and liabilities will the states and countries have who will you be holding accountable and based on what the liabilities be measured and uh, based on what unit will they be debited uh, to the balance sheet and this is the kind of questions that the accounting department asks and the fixed assets in space let's say you're building a hotel or let's say uh, there is um, on the spot uh, source generation or production is done and uh, based on what will the cost be calculated or when you take certain materials from earth and generate in space produce in space what are the outcomes and uh, let's say when you build a resort there the fixed assets and how will you measure the depreciation because it's an, there is there is no law of gravity etc you know and uh, it is there is a weightless uh, setting and uh, the depreciation the wear and tear of a material there and here these are different things it sounds like a dream but in the course of two years imagine everything changed in pandemic so a decade or a five decades later uh, space travels will be a part of our daily lives and indeed this is going to be a daily activity and a reality of life and the depreciation the economic lives etc and in the activity statements or integrated statements the space activity related risks are being identified and the risks being minimized what should the activities be uh, we talked about space debris and ensuring the liability to ensure the assets sent to space space cost of insurance and the related parties that is the company and the state how are you going to divide their liabilities and when we look at space accounting if we are to make a definition this is a subspecialty of economy that ensures the creation of an accounting information system with the purpose of ensuring that entities, establishments can make conscious decisions and ensuring sustainability about space activities and to document and to report what functional activities are being carried out in addition to all economic activities that emerge during the course of space discovery, exploration, understanding, managing and using let's say i have an experience of 27 28 years and my know-how uh, might not be sufficient to do space related activities because in order for me to manage and inspect an accounting system in a company what's being produced there let's say they are producing vinegar or beet juice let's say i need to be conversant they are using burgle or uh, they are using um, some types of vegetables some root vegetables and turnip and we are getting specialized on asset accounting financial uh, accounting or management accounting and we are specialized in different areas so the space related concepts terminology if we don't know it in uh, as regular accountants can we understand and manage those processes it's not possible and uh, there was an employee who used to be a cfo in nasa uh, triggered our activities and in the future as space economy develops space related accounting activities needs to increase he said after we conducted the study uh, i don't remember what university it was in the states but we talked to, uh, to we held a meeting with an associate professor from the u.s 
and he says i was the first one to do space accounting and he started in a class a magazine on accounting uh, he published an accounting uh, article in an accounting journal and i said you didn't uh, make reference to us and there was someone who wrote a book in your country which uh, you didn't whom you didn't refer to and we said the best response is to continue doing this and that American person started chasing after us and they asked to, to publish our article and Turmov's secretary Mr. Arikan when he heard about what happened he said immediately let us have the article and let us have it published in the financial solutions journal in Turkey because we were criticized we were laughed at we were scorned and uh, uh, they said uh, you are replacing uh, actual papers with uh, uh, content that is too pretentious and then um, they understood afterwards and the objective of the space economy is to generate knowledge and uh, it is uh, to use the financial statements of the establishment and to help them make a decision and it's a way to record summarize and report the financial transactions of businesses in space during a given reporting period and it's a way to monitor industrial activities in space and uh, it is to generate knowledge and with this knowledge that is generated it is to try to under explain the interaction between space activities and economy and space accounting acts as a catalyzed catalyst to grow the space researches and industry and it is also used to report and even to classify on a transaction basis and uh, it is a means to monitor industrial activities in space Continuing with the objectives of space accounting to assist in the correct and effective management of space research and space related investments of institutions and uh, to present space exploration and economic data in a timely, comprehensive and comparable manner with sustainability in mind and we ran out of time. I just want to show you this about the scope of space. Uh, Space accounting, currency, technology, infrastructure, contracts and human resources, valuation methods, international agreements, reporting store standards, uh, cost identification models, supervision and auditing, uh, skill sets, taxation, sustainability and integrated reporting and accounting standards are the topics that are intrinsic in space accounting that shows us how space accounting needs to to work and the conclusion is the last word with your permission i need one minute if we think of the economic activities and concepts that need to appear in space activity uh, making active the vehicles that are going to take passengers to the space or uh, to ident to turn um, to construct, uh, to recognize, to identify the costs, to monitor and to report the activities that will be done there and therefore, uh, and therefore uh, the commercial activities of various states and entities are to be reported and recorded simultaneously so that it's consistent and it is understood in the same way by all the users of the financial standard and it is going to introduce a standard we are either going to update the existing standard or we are going to create an altogether new standard when following the symposium all the international accounting institutions and other stakeholders are hereby invited and I would like to end with a quote from Rumi when two beautiful minds together one foot will be up in the sky with, so with so many beautiful minds hopefully one leg is already in the sky and our star and crescent will fly in the space sometime thank you very much <coughs> we would like to thank Ms. Arzu Akhtash very much.
and and also we'd like to thank all the author co-authors of this study as well so all this paper as well I listen to you with pleasure and also it's a source of pride for us that you're a pioneer in this field people uh, do not think you know this also has a accounting related aspect as well it is very surprising but I think uh, this is needed as well so listening to you so I came to realize that why it is necessary to do with this topic as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish we had more time. I wish it was possible for us to listen to you to the end. But as you know that the definition is, uh, of economy is not there are scarce resources but endless needs. So we have scarce time but and what uh, our speakers want to say are endless and then and so let me uh, give you floor to the author of the second paper, Docent and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Ashkel Inge Sökmen. Alaja, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I graduated from the uh, International Relations Department of Istanbul University, and years later I'm here as an Associate Professor, and I'm so happy to be making a presentation on a very important topic. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And because I received my PhD from a military school, and, and I've been examining uh, space in a military sense since 2016. So, the, uh, uh, so, I'm, um, so uh, I'm working on, uh, for example, space terrorism and also, and so I write uh, articles from a, a defense point of view. And, uh, and of course, uh, Moon is the f first target in, in the deep space, so you will see a chance to see the national security uh, aspect more. So my, uh, my paper is, uh, from a military point of view, why is the Moon so important and what kind of dangers and opportunities are offered by the Moon for humanity. And so I'll, I'd like to start with conceptual framework, so the concept of this deep space so uh, was defined by the International Telecommunication U uh, Union because the frequency is given to a, uh, every device that's sent to the center space. But for the dark, the, the dark phase of Moon, and is the is uh, the area uh, that faces Mars, and be, and also all the activity. Uh, the, uh, it also includes all the activities beyond the L2 area, and also and. Um, it, it, it, so it is known um, as a, a piece from an, a killer uh, planet that crashed to Earth and also um, uh, because it has very similarities and this is called a big impact hypothesis. That's why and so the revolving uh, period of, of the moon and uh, the, the world are the same. So the moon is seen as a small piece of the Earth, however it has its own and core, uh, its uh, own or and so why, uh, so why do we see only, only one phase of the moon? And I think this because the mass uh, uh, gravity, and uh, so we uh, so the dark side of the moon is not visible to the Earth. Other than this, why is the moon? Why is the moon important for the Earth? And uh, due to an existential reason. So in sacred order. So, so it was um, placed very well in the orbit of the world, and also when you uh, bring it closer to the Earth, uh, incredible chaos start, and and also when you come down to 10,000, some tectonic earthquakes uh, will occur, and there will be volcano explosions in the world, and uh, this will bring the, uh, the Earth to an end. So this process uh, shows us and how uh, uh, this has to uh, this has to do with how, um, uh, um, the moon should uh, stay where uh, where uh, it is at the moment. And next to that, that, the moon is getting further from the Earth. If uh, if terrestrial group want to destroy the world, uh, destroy the world, and I think it will be sufficient for them to uh, destroy the moon in order to destroy the Earth as well. And so that so. So there is great uh, reset, uh, reset. There are uh, uh, uh, uh, there are lots of conspiracy theories, and in order to realize this, and it would be uh, sufficient to deviate uh, the moon from its orbit, and also 
the heavy earthquakes and also floods and part of the world will be flooded as well. And also I must say that there are certain countries which are thinking about this and then they believe that the orbit of the moon can be changed as well. So this is so this is from the Moonfall book of Jack McDermott. And so this was the main theme of the movie Moonfall, uh, which came so and uh, inspired by a sign and so uh, there are three paths for the moon. The moon can be divided into two. There can be two spirit moons, and also there are so many explosions uh, uh, in the moon, and also uh, and we know that. Um, it is making a dance towards its center, or or an uh, or an asteroid can crash the moon, or the uh, the moon can explode as well. When it comes, so if you have two moons, just like Mars, there will be some climatic changes, and also uh, we will have lots of climate uh, climate change, and also this this would also this is dangerous for humanity in terms of food and other sources. If the moon explodes, and also there will be a a sand clouds, uh, and also uh, and also in, in the long term, for example, life can come to an end because sunlight can will not be able, able to reach the earth. And also, this is uh, so uh, these were written uh, inspired from uh, by uh, the seven uh, seven eaves uh, novel of Neil Stephenson. So the moon is divided into seven, and also, um, and also uh, the, the the biggest part can create a huge and. Um, sand a cloud which will be revolving with the earth and also some pieces of the moon can reach the earth and also can threaten life on the earth, on earth uh, so if there are two uh, moon satellites and so the, uh, this would cause some excessive uh, temperature changes then it is said that uh, the earth can turn into what mass is expressing today so the china has three artificial moon projects and also you see the core structure and so these are working with a reactor and they will be orbited and so the so the, the main principle is a mirror system so the main purpose of this artificial moon is to integrate sun rays to the earth and also creating uh, endless energy however since the mirror theory was developed in the time of hitler and also uh, it is also disruptive and it can be used as a weapon although china says it's using this as uh, for civilian purpose uh, for civilian purposes and so uh, they can reach a position which can destroy a certain city or country. If you lose the moon, uh, so this uh, artificial and uh, um, celestial, uh, so we believe that, uh, and also scientists uh, recognize the idea that we can uh, sustain life on Earth thanks to some uh, uh, thanks to such uh, artificial celestial bodies, and also. So can it be as, as a substitute for Earth? And so Elon Musk and many scientists are talking about this at the moment. There is no life. So yes, the world is a cradle of life. So we can't li live on this planet any longer. For example, and can you render a, a celestial body that you can reach in three days a livable as the world? Can it be green? So it is very green for the moment, but. Um, so, because it's subject to uh, solar explosions, for example, uh, on the right hand side, uh, one of the new uh, life habitat areas to be constructed uh, on the moon. So, uh, moon, sa uh, moon sa uh, sand will be used and also it will be buried. So, so there, there will be no habitable areas on the surface of the earth that will be subject to sun rays and so there has to be icicles and also there has to be uh, water, hydrogen and also an artificial and also uh, atmosphere uh, and if this is the case then there can be some living platforms as well so they are considering this for Mars as well. This is one of the projects of Elon Musk but uh, whether it should be Mars or the moon. But uh, so. Um, so can we, uh, can we turn it to the concept that we call the green moon? So what does the moon mean for world leadership from the perspective of international relations? So uh, so the numbers on the moon topography you see on the right, so these are the points, it shows the points that the United States landed as part of their Apollo project. So Apollo 11 was a very important success achievement for humanity and uh, so and of course uh, this is important because of the space competition that they impact upon with russia when yuri gagarin made this 
uh, the United States was about to lose the leadership, and, and so they uh, uh, they uh, grasped leadership once again with the Asian moon landing project. And why are they going back to the moon following uh, the Apollo 17 mission? Because China is engaged in some very intensive activities in, uh, uh, uh, on the moon. So the Apollo prepares many layers and also among these layers. And we can say that 24 times manned uh, visits have been made and also the moon trace on the moon. Uh, so it's a small step for me, but a big leap for humanity. And, uh, uh, and so it is very important in bring, uh, in uh, putting uh, the United States uh, in a leadership position and also Artemis is the a moon a lunar goddess, so this is a new project, as you can see, of NASA. And also, uh, in the background, you see the habitat areas that are on the moon. And according to research, recent research, some article samples have been found, and also water has been found as well. And also, because uh, certain uh, products can be or can also be uh, cultivated in on the in the moon soil, and also uh, the purpose is to. Uh, be able to reach Mars, which which faces the dark side of the moon. Now it takes eight months to reach Mars, and they want to reduce this to three months. The longer people can stay on the moon uh, or on space, and all the astronomic studies have shown that even if it is staying uh, in space for one year, changes the physiological and also mental structures of hum of humans. That's why the outer space or this space is a closed area for humanity, and also most scientists. <coughs> believe that uh, the studies in the world should continue in the low orbit. However, uh, so the United States <laughs> is starting their uh, new project and with Orion, and this, uh, and uh, so they will be going, to, uh, they will go to the moon as well. One of the four astronauts going to the moon this time will be a female and a black astronaut, and apparently this will be in 2025. And also the Soviets and also China have some and plans about a moon as well. So uh, another science fiction uh, writer is talking about, for example, Arthur Clarke is using some lunar bases, and this, uh, this is materializing now, and China and Russia are making agreements about the surface of the moon, and, and China in 2019 had the achievement of making a landing to the dark side of the moon, and also they uh, conducted some electromagnetic spectrum studies, uh, so this is a new weapon-related activities of China, and uh, so, this, uh, so this is also creating a, a security dilemma, and also if America leaves China on its own, then they believe that they will lose losing their global leadership. So the, uh, so the South Pole, uh, Russia, China, and America, and India, Israel, and all the other countries would like to land to the South Pole uh, of the moon, because this area receives uh, solar areas all the time, and also it is it seems to be a livable area because there's, there are icicles in it. However, the remaining parts receive uh, solar rays only one month later, so there will be incredible competition and confrontation on the South Pole of the Moon, and from a military point of view, and in terms of military force, and from uh, the uh, the point of view of the space geopolitics and Terra. So this area and the distance between the moon is a very critical area, these Lagrange areas, because they can be fixed. So they are the most geopolitically important areas. And also they, um, so um, it is as if the moon can uh, prevent uh, or can uh, form a security wall for all the troubles uh, the, the world can face. So when you look at, uh, for example, surface of the moon, you can be see you can see many meteors. Uh, you can see the uh, you can see dents caused by many meteors colliding the Earth face or the moon. And also, I wrote, for example, this. Uh, so this was an article about how a country can be successful on the face of the moon. And also, and last year I. I talked about, for example, some energy weapons in the world. So these are micro laser particular uh, particle weapons. They are invisible, and for you can start a fire anywhere in the world, and they can you can tr trigger earthquakes as well. So we we call, we, we call this space threats, and moon is a very a, is very suitable place for this. And once you place this weapon on them, then you can establish your dominance on the face of the earth. 
though this is the main reason why the countries are competing with each other, because they are uh, struggling or competing to become stronger uh, from a multiple point of view as well. So this like large like areas will be colonized, and also there will be an economic, a political, and also military competition very important. This large range um, points. So there are five of these points, and, and also L4 and L5 are, are of critical importance because you can never. So these are points. Uh, in the, in space, you can't be, you can't stand constant, but it's possible to stay to be to remain fixed in L4 and L5. So the, so for example, the mirrors are placed on L5, and also the art. Uh, so the China's artificial uh, moon projects uh, have been defined to be placed on L4 and L5. So these are very critical points. And uh, so America or China settling on this point is very important to show to the world their world dominance as well. And also, and so silicon and also there are some rare uh, soil elements and also helium-3 and water and also some precious metals. Uh, helium-3 is a rare material uh, because uh, um, uh, sun, uh, solar rays uh, come uh, to the face of the moon directly. So as you can have nuclear energy and also there are uh, people are thinking of making a reactor this is what trump said so they'd like to f establish a nuclear reactor on, on the moon and also they'd like they, they are uh, planning to create some thrust to go to mars and helium 3 can also is strong enough to meet uh, to meet all the electricity needs of a country and also it's a shortcut to go to the mars and also uh, so the distance between the moon, between the moon and, and Mars are much shorter than the distance from the Earth to Mars. And also, uh, so there is also a space mirror project in order to solve um, global warming as well. So, uh, so these mirrors. So one face of the Webb telescope is mirror, and also they, uh, so they reflect the rays coming from uh, solar beams uh, to the outer world in order to prevent uh, excessive carbon dioxide, uh, dioxide so that the world can be protected for a long time. However, this mirror project was also caused as a weapon by Hitler, and uh, it is important who will use this project for peaceful purposes. Uh, so, so the one, 1969 Space Agri uh, Treaty and also the 79 Moon Treaty are very important, and also there are some microwave, also particle weapons, and also laser, and also there are some giant mirror weapons. And uh, so we can say that uh, the space is weaponized using all these. And also, so this is, uh, if you can have your uh, name and role to the Artemis project, and also you can uh, apply uh, uh, on uh, NASA's website. I've added myself on behalf of Turkey. As you know, the moon is a very important critical area, and it cannot be simplified. I hope the world cannot be destroyed, and the world order will continue for a long time. Thank you very much. Indeed, it was, uh, these are very interesting papers and I would like to thank you with uh, all my heart. It was very interesting. And there is one question that is stuck in my mind that I would like to ask you because at some point in your speech, you said China is entering this real fast and that it's starting to become effective, which really whipped NASA into acting faster. So had China not done that, would NASA act as fast or not? NASA and the <coughs> Pentagon's biggest problem is the budget that comes out from the Senate and they need a threat. And Russia and Putin said, had it not been for me, Pentagon's budgets would have not, would have not been approved. And China is a factor that accelerates it. And in Netflix, there is about there is a two episode series on space forces. As the budgets are decreased, there is this fear that they will be left behind, and you will see the Chinese flag everywhere on the moon, and our space domination will end. That is the perception. So, in one sense, China is supporting NASA. So, this space conflict turning into a collaboration would help. Uh, for the sake of humanity and you know Turkey we're going to have a rough landing in, on the moon and we're going to hopefully become a part of these international activities thank you for shedding light on this and we're going to enjoy listening to another paper 
Mr. Mehmet Fırat Olgun is going to deliver a presentation, but is it physical? Oh, yes, it's going to be online. <coughs> you got 15 minutes, Mr. Mehmet, and we'll be listening to you. Hi, dear professors. I would like to greet you all with my deepest respect. Let me share my uh, <coughs> slide. I think you can see it, right? My name is Mehmet and I'm an academic at Kastamonu University and I'm a PhD student at Istanbul University and uh, this is about the uh, my speech is about the NASA growth uh, NASA budget and the economic growth relation and a causality approach The objective of this study is to uh, tackle from a causality standpoint and uh, the NASA budget between 1961 and 2001 has been examined and before we start the analysis let me talk about the uh, activities uh, Russia's with the Sputnik uh, being launched into the orbit, the space activities officially started and the US founded NASA in order to be able to carry out its space activities. And due to high risks in space industries and due to technical uh, lack of capabilities, the development continued with public financing and in the private industry, Certain billionaires saw how valuable that this is, so they entered this industry. Financing is a problem uh, because uh, the investment amounts are high and uh, the uh, amounts are suspicious, the amounts earned, because there are going to be certain hesitations and uh, the legal uh, arrangements about the activities likely to be carried out in the space are not at a sufficient level the investment period of the potential investments space related investments are quite long and new companies uh, cannot stay in the market therefore so there is a too big of an uncertainty in the market conditions and there's also a language barrier between the parties that want to make best use of the space potential investment opportunities and the financiers. This is the budget, federal budget and NASA's share. But in the scope of the Apollo project, the budget was very high uh, because NASA supported this and in 1965, uh, NASA's share in federal budget is uh, peaking and the NASA budget was quite high and even in 2018 inflation this corresponds to about 32 billion dollars and the budget in the Apollo period in the actual budget on an average with average figures, it's 2.5. Of course, once NASA completed its Apollo project, the budget rates are declining. <laughs> so it varies between 1% to 5 per mil. And there are political uh, motives that, uh, that are in the forefront. And when you look at the budget distribution of NATO, the budget uh, is uh, 23 billion. And these are manned space flights, and this, these are the budgets to further the scientific explorations as well as facility management, personnel salaries, and the development of space technologies. We see that the budget is being spent for these activities. And uh, when we look at NASA's contributions to the U.S. economy, we can see the indirect effects and direct effects and NASA employees in employment contribution and the indirect includes NASA procurements and the production of suppliers. Stimulated effects include NASA employees consumption expenditures as well as the expenditures of the NASA suppliers and the technology transfers.
when uh, as for the direct effect of NASA, the number we see the percentage of the number of employees in space industry that's five percent even though there are small changes we can say that the average is five percent and this is the effect of nasa employees on space industry but uh, nasa has a huge effect on space industry and we see the direct or indirect effect on employment the highest contribution is in California. It corresponds to 5% of the economy and the entire contribution means over 300,000 uh, people uh, employed. And there is a $23.7 million contribution and for each full-time job, there are over 17 jobs and uh, which uh, paves the path for new developments. And uh, for each million dollars, uh, it leads to uh, $7 million of labor revenues. And these activities are supported with major procurement ex expenditures and we see the contribution in terms of economic output NASA's uh, contribution per state and uh, again California is in the summit with 21 25 percent of the it's 16.6 .6 billion dollars and also as for NASA's contributions there's a seven million dollar tax revenue and there is a technology transfer and there's a, an efficiency and global uh, tax advantage is seen and when we look at the technology transfer of NASA we see different uh, uh, industries that receive the uh, transfer in the patent database, uh, there are uh, over 6,833 patents and in health, medicine, national security, computer technologies, production and consumption, and environmental management and resource management. And in production and consumption, the highest figure is between 1976 and 2017 uh, the, this is being supported strongly uh, what are the technologies that nasa uses in the present life there are close to 6800 patented products and uh, i used an image that was used in nasa's website this is the technology deemed the most important, and I wanted to include some of them. Uh, portable computers, uh, weapons, uh, uh, memory foams, all these uh, are, NASA is the inventor of most of them. And we see NASA as the developing entity and frozen food and smoke detectors, prosthetics, wireless headsets, uh, telephone cameras are also a part of this. The study is an applied study and in literature there are many studies on NASA. Uh, and from an econometric standpoint, if there are, I, I wanted to focus on the studies that were conducted. Mackey conducted a study in the year 2012 and they have examined the NASA and the private sector contribution on space industry and space economy. The information obtained is surprising because they have used OLS predictors in the analysis. So in case of $1 billion of budget to NASA, the contribution in terms of employment in the space industry is 24,000 and the long-term employment in space economy is an employment of 40,000 but this is the data of 1990 to 2008 
and uh, NASA is not a direct employment provider, and the employ employment providers are the private sector and the entrepreneurs. It, it's just that NASA allows uh, employment, and from an econometric standpoint, there is a relation on national defense and growth. Uh, uh, Liu et al. in 2008 indicates that space-related technology expenditures are an expenditure item and there is a growth of uh, 1% which is going to increase it uh, by multiples and there is a study in 2017 and that the military studies affected uh, negatively and 63 countries have been examined and the countries that were not successful and perhaps uh, their, uh, re the resources can be used in another way and, and uh, in a study by Abdal Kalek in 2020 there's a cause there is no causality relation between the military expenditures and growth and in our study there is the growth and nasa share in the federal uh, budget and the causality relation has been examined and there's a yomomoto causality analysis first of all uh, whether uh, they were stable or not uh, was examined uh, and uh, ADTP uh, we have used the Phillips Ferron uh, unit root tests and the results indicate that growth is stable and constant and the NASA budget is not uh, constant and uh, there is the Perron and uh, Zivot Andrews structural breakdown shows that it is constant. The unit root test results dif differ. Some are zero and some are I1. So causality test uh, has been done and also the optimum delay length has been identified. And uh, the, in the second delay of the same, uh, oh, we see an optimum delay length. And this optimum delay length uh, shows that in order to ensure that there is no uh, variance, the autocorrelation test was done. And in the second delay, the probe value was shown as 0 0.3 to 3. So the basic of the hypothesis is that there is no autocorrelation and in the 1% meaningfulness test shows that there are no autocorrelation results in the delay test and when we look at the characteristics reverse roots of the uh, error uh, terms the results were consistent and finally, we have conducted the heteroscedasticity test and uh, the probe value was bigger than 0 0.10. So we could say that this analysis, uh, there was no heteroscedasticity uh, issue. After we conducted all these tests, we move on to the causality test and the results of the Todo Yamamoto were shown on the chart. And from the NASA budget to growth, there was a statistically meaningful result. That is, the NASA budget is the cause of the growth as we have reached the results. And uh, because... W we just examined whether there is a causality relation or not. But the, from growth to NASA budget, there is no causality relation. And this growth to NASA budget correlation, does, the politics are important because in uh, between 1960 or 1970, NASA budget was quite high. But subsequently, because of the political factors, we can see that it was restricted and this budget limitation also had to do with private sector being a part of this could be a reason 
and as a consequence we uh, if we were to make an assessment i can say that there are over 6800 technological inventions within nasa that were done by the scientists and the findings indicate that there is a monodirectional causality relation between the NASA budget to the USA economic growth, growth and the uh, space is an industry that needs to be supported uh, because of the contributions to research and development and training and education and innovation and economic growth and high quality employment and elevating life quality, the protection of nature and disaster management. We talked about many inventions, but the numbers can be increased. And even though the space sector seems quite risky in terms of allocating time, money and resources, it's got high yields because famous billionaires are trying to enter this industry which is why uh, the uh, famous billionaires are trying to enter this uh, industry and this requires public funding and our starting point is the fact that this uh, space industry was supported with the public uh, resources and uh, again the most famous example is NASA so NASA's relation uh, growth was studied from an econometric standpoint and there are many NASA related studies but there are very few econometric studies and in the last two or three decades sp the private sector has significantly invested in space industry and the NASA's share in the US GNDP has declined while it's important Supporting new enterprises in the space industry is a mere indicator of the rise of privatization and NASA's share between the private uh, federal budget changes between five per mil to one percent, but it, in the past it used to be 2.5 and the incentives need to be increased to support new enterprises to enhance the competitive edge. This is my presentation and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. We'd like to thank Mehmet Fuyat Olgun for his presentation. NASA has uh, of course, NASA, NASA's budget is making a contribution to the growth, but uh, uh, the, the, the budget is now getting smaller, and also, and of course, this is about the sensitivity of the American society about how their taxes are spent. Uh, there are concerns uh, about this. What kind of an arrangement is the United States doing? As far as we understand, they are trying to motivate the private sector uh, so that uh, space-related tasks or activities can be handled uh, in a most effective way. And the, big, uh, and the largest billionaires uh, of, the, of the world are Americans or Chinese people. And just like America, although China uh, has a socialist uh, market mechanism, all, uh, so they are playing the games within the, with the rules of the capitalist system, and the richest people of the world are Americans and also Chinese billionaires. And the number of these billionaires is now getting even. So there are as many uh, Chinese billionaires as American billionaires as well. And of course, in, uh, China has a different situation, and, and China doesn't have to uh, also influence the public opinion. Uh, however, the America has to do this, and apparently the role of private industry will become even more evident. And so we will now move on to another paper, which will, uh, which we will listen to with pleasant, by Associate Professor Hilmi Rahmet, uh, Rafet Yunju. Now the floor is yours. Esteemed professors, I, I think you can hear me. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I'd like to salute all the professors with respect. I really wish I was among you 
but today is the birthday of two people who are so close, so important to me. So it's my children's birthday. That's why I'm attending remotely and I'd like to apologize to you all. So let me share my presentation if I may. Can you see my slides? Uh, I can't. I can't see. Uh, it's. Uh, I think it's okay. Okay, no problems. I'd like to greet you all with respect, respect once again. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, "From Fiction to uh, Reality: and uh, A Journey to Beyond Space." So I'd like to uh, to address this topic from a tourism point of view and this is uh, you know f more of an entertainment related part of space why from fiction to reality first and foremost so and uh, to tell you about tourism and in general so so it is uh, so tourism is the fastest growing industry in the world and so and also tourism brings about uh, economic growth for uh, regions and it also ensures an equal uh, income distribution and uh, among the, among the regions and also as an industry it generates jobs and, and also it generates new jobs and at the same time uh, in those areas where tourism is developed and we see that this, the living standards of the population improve. And also in addition to this, uh, it contributes to the balance of payments and also uh, a, as mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, humanity and mankind have always been interested, have always been drawn to space. Uh, some of them has regarded space as God and and uh, some of them had a dream of reaching it and some considered it as science and uh, once upon a time there was an so it was uh, it was seen as a futuristic or a, as a utopia and it was seen as a reality that needed to be reached and with this when we look at Joe Vance's uh, journey to the moon which he wrote in 1865 and in 1960s and Stanley Kubrick and also Sir Arthur Clarke uh, shot the movie a Space Odyssey and showed and so they dreamed that you, uh, people were having we're setting on a futuristic journey in an environment with zero G. Of course, all of these have brought about the mankind's desire to to go to space. So when we look at space studies, they emerged with the Cold War, and in the first half of the 20th century, so. It continued to Yuri Yuri Gagarin, and in 16, uh, 1969, we, uh, so the United States landed on the moon, and also with the end of the Soviet Cold War, and also with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and also with a, a, a declining public support in the United States, and there were many accidents as well. All of these uh, decreased the interest in, in space, but people's interest still continues. And also, uh, a concept called space travel emerged. And when we look at its de definition, definition, it's going to be on atmosphere in order to participate in entertainment, sports, and also research recreation, and also to stay in space hotels. And so, just like in tourism, it's about going out of the ordinary life and also uh, engaging in a different activity. Other than other than that, um, so.
So what are the expectations of space tourists? So they'd like to see uh, spa they'd like to see the, the Earth and space. So this is something uh, every human being would like to experience. They'd like to see uh, space and they'd like to observe the space and also the Earth. And also, they'd like to experience lack of weight in microgravity. And of course, uh, this happens at a certain level and, and under certain circumstances. And also, they'd like to receive some... Uh, astro um, they'd like to be trained as an astronaut before the flight. And also, they'd like to communicate with people and um, on the Earth from space. And also, they'd like to, uh, they also want to collect certain souvenirs and also some documents and also memories as well. The, uh, so the current point that we have reached about space tourism and also when we look at relationship of tourism and space and uh, how are these experiences realizing uh, in line with the so, so the uh, space travel community uh, evaluates all these under four headings. So there are five dimensions in the other studies. As you can see uh, on the graph on the left hand side of this slide, uh, so that there is cost and labor. And so as the costs uh, increase, a participation goes down because uh, as mentioned in previous uh, presentations, uh, because uh, space spendings and uh, are bringing about uh, considerable costs as well. So how are these uh, space tourism uh, experiences realized? There are some computer simulations or also there are some and um, virtual reality taking place in the, in cyber, in, in the cyber world. Since simulations are used as well. There are some zero gravity flights. This is another uh, level, and there are some low orbit flights, and also real space. So we see such a uh, classification or an ordering, as you can see. Uh, so the number of participants decreases from the bottom um, to the top. Because, as I said a couple of minutes ago, uh, because the costs and are, uh, are somewhat higher in comparison to other tourism-related activities. So what are the benefits of space tourism? It has some economic benefits, and political benefits, and also cultural benefits as well. So, uh, so economic benefits, uh, so there's a nar shrinking economy in the world today. And so uh, we witness or experience this shrinkage uh, in certain periods, and then we can see the impact of these uh, on societies. So space tourism uh, activities and also studies have some economic uh, uh, benefits, and we can uh, say that they ensure they provide some new ex uh, some new uh, expansions, and also what are its political benefits. China and the United States are, for example, uh, acting together, acting collectively in their space activities. And uh, so space tourism uh, is uh, making it possible for some arch rivals to uh, uh, act together uh, under certain projects, and it's, uh, it has some cultural benefits as well. So. So it brings about some new expansions for people and also societies and make progress from a technological point of view with these space studies and, and with some new R&D studies and people are going f and are doing better and uh, so these are some of the benefits of space tourism. In 1990s and there were certain studies and especially about space tourism uh, and to what point people will be traveling to. And uh, between 2000 and 2010, the, the, the forecasts uh, were about zero gravity flights and also, uh, and also uh, some uh, flights uh, providing some space experience were foreseen as well. And also, 
and uh, between 2010 and 2015 and and people started talking about some short uh, short time or short pe uh, period uh, short distance flights uh, uh, to the low orbit up to 100 kilometers from the earth and uh, in from 2020 to 2030 there will be a experiences of one or two days and this they will go up to 450 kilometers from the face of the earth and uh, so the, of course these are just estimations and uh, from 2030 to 2040 there will be some lunar orbit flights uh, which these will last 10 to 14 days from 2040 to 2050 there will be some lunar orbit flights and from uh, 2050 and People will be traveling uh, to accommodate on, in the hotels to be established on the face of the moon. So these were the forecasts then. And <coughs> space studies are mainly the scientific research uh, uh, work going on as scientific and also military researches. However, space activities from a, uh, in a touristic uh, context, uh, context started after the uh, 1990s or 2000s, and in 1990, a Japanese journal, uh, uh, a Japanese journalist went to space, but he's uh, considered as a tourist because this activity was uh, funded by his company, so he didn't make any personal sp uh, uh, spendings. Because it was founded by his company, he wasn't considered, he wasn't regarded as a tourist, and also, and uh, we see Dennis Tito as a space tourist. And then in 2005, 6, and uh, 2007, 2008, and 2009, and uh, different people went to space for touristic purposes. And in, in 2000, 21, Yusako Mayazawa, a, a Japanese national, uh, went uh, to space in 2021, and Jared Isaacman went to space in December 2021. All, all the previous flights were astronaut flights. However, Jared Isaacman as you can see in the picture at the bottom of the slide, went to space with the participation of four people, a professional. So four ordinary people traveled to space without the participation of a professional astronaut, and they stayed in space for a about four days during their travel. <coughs> as can be seen, space agencies and call these space explorers, or uh, they call them the participants of space explora private space explorations, but and so in general terms, we can say that with their self-financing, we believe that these people may be regarded or are considered as space tourists. As mentioned in the previous uh, presentations, this uh, has, has a remarkable economic dimension. That's why many companies are have, uh, or many companies are working on certain space activities, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Bigelow Aerospace, and Blue Origin. So, So these companies have some investments, uh, so we said they're investing in space tourism as well. So why is uh, the, the importance of space tourism becoming important? Because um, so the private area of professional uh, astronauts is becoming accessible for other people as well and uh, people who are looking for different adventures. And uh, so the space is creating and some new areas uh, for the leisure activities of, or for people who are looking for some new adventures. 
in uh, July 2021, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin initiated their uh, low orbit uh, space programs, and also in September 2021, SpaceX um, had an inspiration for mission, and they initiated their tr uh, space tourism-related problems with the launch. So uh, at the beginning, I said that it was a niche market, and especially in the post forties period, with tourism changing and going through some transformation, alternative types of tourism are coming to the forefront. And also tourists are now, tourists today are looking for some extraordinary types of tourism. And uh, this also increases people's uh, interest in space tourism, however, and people are making reference or a uh, reference to certain uh, different risks as well and put, uh, faced by potential space tourists in addition to this and safety is the uh, the main consideration of today's space tourists because so the for the continuation of their lives and And uh, safety is one is one of the most important priorities of modern tourists in order to avoid certain negative situations that they may face uh, in space. And so, with some extreme types of so, it can be evaluated with some extreme types of tourism. And I think the most important drivers or the most important. Ba uh, barriers to overcome for the development of space tourism is to be able to take people to space and to bring them back. And uh, so this is one of the biggest challenges facing uh, space tourism. So what kind of risks uh, fa uh, are facing this uh, space tourist? So, uh, so space tourists do uh, do not have control, and so we talked about modern tourists and modern tourists attach great importance on safety and also their self planning. However, in space they are not in control. Uh, so, con uh, the control is in the hands of others, and uh, when this is the case, and. So uh, the safety perception of space tourists is damaged, and also there are some uh, long flight theory in flight times, and so there's a reduction in people's uh, bone mass, and also, and uh, and also there, uh, so there is uh, there's a reduction in the also muscle intensity uh, as well, and also uh, due to uh, ex uh, exposure to radiation, there could be some. Uh, cases of cancer as well. That's why, due to these reasons, we see that people sometimes uh, prefer virtual realities. So we're listening to you, we're listening to you with pleasure, but you're out of time. And so I'm, so I just need, I just need, I just need one minute. <laughs> I'm sorry for talking a bit too much. As you can see, when you create an industry in low orbit, and what kind of a problem will it cause for climate change? This is not known either. And so, uh, of course, uh, this is in contradiction with the sustainability idea of tourism because it requires um, high costs as well. Uh, so, the, uh, so they also. Uh, pose another risk, and is uh, space tourism uh, will remain a type of tourism only for the rich, or uh, will it be possible to travel to some other celestial bodies as well? As and another question, despite all the all the risks and all the costs. Will people be willing? Uh, 
uh, to travel to space. So we, we are still in the fiction part. And to what extent will it turn from fiction to reality? There are some examples of this, but despite all these paradoxes and also expectations, space tourism is an important activity in order to and and overcome people's uh, curiosity or to quench the curiosity of people. And so, would it be a strong market? It's still, this is still controversial today. And we'll just have to wait and see this in the coming years. Thank you very much. Sorry uh, for overusing my time. Thank you, Professor Rafet. And by the way, uh, we would like to celebrate the birthday, congratulate the birthday of your beautiful children. Now we've got one last paper, if I'm not mistaken. And without losing time, uh, please kindly introduce yourself and uh, uh, talk about your uh, paper. Hi, my name is Jan Susoylu. Uh, I would like to express how happy I am and I would like to thank for being invited to this uh, valuable and futuristic symposium. During the course of two days, we're listening to wonderful arguments about the space and I would like to talk about logistics, which is the backbone of space. And I'm going to talk about space logistics and space exploratory logistics. And I hope I can continue without boring you. This was in my PhD uh, assertion. And uh, this is going to present an exploratory assessment about the logistics of the uh, space. Uh, and our method is... Uh, semi-structured interview and literature screening. There are 10 or 12 people who we interviewed uh, in NASA, so that was a different path for us. And the context, uh, contents include integrated logistics support approach, followed by space exploratory logistics methodology discussion and conclusions and assessment and integrated logistics supports and logistics processes in the simplest sense uh, from the production of a spare part from the production of a, a software or hardware it is being included in the guarantee scope and this is about the uh, products that will complete its uh, useful life and these are these are processes that have emerged in the military life the definition of support receiving support the definition of design project type production and product providing support so these are uh, processes that are supported lifelong and to begin with if we're talking about space uh, we have to talk about Earth, and all this uh, research uh, began in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, the Earth globe being a world, and that idea uh, gave way to geographical discoveries, and those uh, um, there were uh, incredible ships built to past those huge uh, oceans and they discovered the continents and driven by curiosity people uh, get curious about space and after looking up into sky there is this uh, unlimited uh, and endless space uh, and when we look at the space logistics uh, this is the implementation of the space design uh, theory and implementation in order to ensure the knowledge, services, material flow management and operation of the system. So it's a system that covers, it's an art and it's a an science that covers the entire process and the importance of logistics and space exploration. Like I said, it's the backbone and in the absence of logistics systems, space is more uh, imaginary and more futuristic unfortunately and from uh, satellite production to rocket production it's a simultaneous supply and demand and multidisciplinary logistics approach we see the historical development of space logistics and uh, there was a logistics need to ensure that the discovery and explorations were sustainable after 1916 and 
There were a total of six short missions as part of the Apollo program between 69 and 72, and no logistics networks were used. They were just like going on a camp, taking the necessary supplies. So the exploratory process was using a backpack model, like bring your own backpack model. And the space station logistics, international space station logistics, this was uh, based on orders and they were planned resupplies and the objective was to ensure that the astronauts that go there and the activities were supplied uh, with shuttles. Uh, I would like to talk about the International Space Station. It began in 1998 and it consisted of 48 missions and it was a massive laboratory and there was participation worldwide. And this is, uh, there is something very important and valuable. This is proof that a, it is possible to live in an artificial habitat and integrated logistics support, just like I said, has to do with uh, lifelong support of the mission uh, system likewise. And the project and the program and the product are supported lifelong. So from the ordering stage to the warranty stage and the after sales process. And so the entire process, this is called tailoring. And this is called uh, also the, the various parts can be bought and replaced through tailoring and trade-offs. And the interplanetary, interplanetary logistic process includes this. Let me talk about the logistics process we are using on Earth. So the, this process is uh, the interplanetary implementability is important and planning the routes and the stopping points, space storages and sustainable exploratory explore, uh, approaches. And let me talk about the, I'm coming from a maritime and marine background. There is a feeder and mothership and hub and spoke systems are at play. So you can think of it, uh, the world just like in ISS placing the earth in the orbit and this structure uh, being able to launch a rocket and we as it was discussed in yesterday's presentation uh, using resources on the spot and which leads to long in the long range flights in the long range launches uh, attaining success uh, through this approach is important because until a rocket going uh, to Mars from Earth, you cannot keep uh, burning the fuel unlim in an unlimited way. So you need to live with the uh, space, uh, with the speed of light. And there are fueling stations. You can consider those storages in the like a fuel tank on Earth, the supply of fuel or the procurement of any material in the storages used. The creation of those storages are being planned. And from a sustainability standpoint, environmental, public and economy are the three important pillars. And environment is, uh, you know, when it comes to launching the rockets, what is the environmental impact on Earth? And also <clears throat> the satellites that have been launched, what is the pollution uh, caused in the atmosphere? And uh, what are the contributions to the public? And what are the yields or the losses from an economical standpoint? And also reusable systems, waste uh, recycling. And I don't know if you were aware in the previous years, there was a, together with Elon Musk, the, the Falcon 9 was launched and this was the first reusable rocket and this was a groundbreaking in that regard and in 2018 right during the time I was holding the uh, interviews the, there was the Steinman 
uh, but they did prove something so in a sense uh, they could review this with a tourism uh, approach using resources on site uh, and space mining lunar industrialization is an approach that everyone is talking about and it's not about the moon only the planets or the artificial structures being used on site is what we're talking about benefiting from them and then building the next missions on top of this and let me move on to the methodology a bit this is rather exploratory in our approach and we indeed discovered great things along with the interviews and in the beginning stage the primary and secondary phases uh, brought us certain data primary data talked about the fact that there is not enough data and we had data privacy issues as well as language issues as for the secondary data uh, when it, uh, the institutions and entities to help such authorities are limited to aviation activities difficulty in terms of reaching foreign institutions and geography becoming your destiny as the saying goes in turkey and as for the design of the research uh, there was an this was an individual discovery and exploration journey there was persistence motive to learn uh, to be able to uh, prove that geography is not your destiny and something can be done for the environment and uh, the monitoring and tracing and exploratory data were obtained there were a total of 41 keywords that were used and uh, space exploration space transportation and logistics were the keywords that we used and every word that we came up and every article that we came up guided us and using the those keywords we, we diversified the keywords and there were a total of 41 keywords and 417 uh, resources in this assertion and the sampling selection had to do with tracing and feedback and after talking to x many people in line with their recommendations we reached the next person and the data obtained was monitored in this way and how did we reach these people uh, social networks websites and various associations and organizations there is a sampling space how i communicated with these people and when it comes to data analysis there are two stages and the first stage is about on a participant basis open and external coding uh, and the categories were compared and converted into general categories and after everything was completed and after the interviews were over we had further restrictions the secondary data restrictions remained the same but the data the restrictions the social perspective as well as different uh, foreign entities and organizations and difficult to reach them time difference and uh, um, not being able to access local authorities restrictions in sharing knowledge and information lack of trust and unwillingness to unwillingness to share information and as uh, literature findings on an entity basis in the, the space agencies with the highest publishing volumes followed by the universities the military and the private sector as well as the individuals <coughs> And from a year standpoint, there is a growing acceleration trend in 2015. And the reason is the important uh, developments in space exploratory activities and this being fed into and fueling future researches and elevating them to the next researches and uh, next stage that's why we have so many stages methods used in obtaining literature observation simulation mid modeling experiments and observation and if we were to make a general definition when the environmental factors are taken into account this is a set of uh, 
discoveries and scientific activities that are systemized within the scope of space activities that take as the basis information and material flow that can be supported where needs can be met in a timely manner. And there are two dimensions here. One is the actualized dimension. Right now, NASA and various space agencies are carrying out. And the second is the dimension that wishes to be fulfilled. And this is the Earth connected. There is, there is, this is limited. And what we want to do is we want no connection with Earth. Uh, we want resources to be used on the site that can renew themselves, that can be reused and with uh, lower costs. And in our last part, in our la last section, this is going to be an interpretive approach. There are seven facts about logistics and from an operation logistics standpoint, I'm going to assess the logistic process of the space exploration, exploratory approach and suggestions for future studies. And if we were to assess from an operation logistics standpoint, space exploratory logistics uh, are identical with the lifelong logistics support and integrated logistics support. And uh, uh, the space exploratory logistics can be examined in three branches, namely design development and operation. And this is uh, the process uh, information and exploratory information feed each other and here we see all this cycle and this is the output a drawing that I have obtained first of all there is the earth the logistics and then there is a rocket that is being launched and let's say they are going to Mars including the extravehicular activities all the processes resupply waste management and flows are in the forefront and every process is uh, taking place with simultaneous integrated management technical know-how and exploratory know-how are feeding each other and it's continuing with feedbacks in this process and what matters is uh, to just like in the logistics right information right time right product and uh, uh, the right place in the plane of demand. These are the uh, main actors of logistics. And the main critical issue is that what is the desire to be done is entirely outside the planes. And because there is no ground, that's why time is essential. The best use of the time needs to be done. So uh, the necessary demand and the necessary supply uh, should be able to be addressed correctly and this is a complicated chart and this is the most recent process that we have came up with it covers the entire process I'm sure you're having difficulties seeing it and uh, this is the lifelong integrated logistics support that I was mentioning before mission control because in space uh, explorations program mission product and process basis approaches are available in these activities and if we have time maybe in the subsequent years i can tell it in further p detail and if we are to look at the exploration just like we have said in the beginning exploring and the desire to explore are uh, is an approach that can be created with motives and the space is endless and infinite so exploration and space are similar and abstract but logistics is a theory and it works in practice and it is a combining it is a logist it is a discipline that brings the things together so it mediates what is known and what wants to be known so there's a different sociological outcome that I came with in geographical discoveries the Europeans considering that it was the Europeans that discovered the American continent the Europeans uh, of the day that is the Americans of the present day are discovering space and there's a cultural or there's a genetic interaction 
I don't have an idea, but this is one of the things that needs to be explored. Uh, sorry, but you have run out of your time and you have exceeded your time. My presentation is over. So the, all the resources that I have examined were uh, with an engineering background by 95%. We should step outside the boundaries of techniques and look at it from a business as the operations uh, window and because I think there is a lot of data. Thank you very much and this is all I have to say. We would like to thank Ms. Jansu Soylu and Ms. Jansu Yildirim. I wish we had more time and I wish we were able to listen to all of these in a healthy way. You know, I was forced to intervene with great regret and I apologize because I have to tell this to all the speakers because we ran out of time and because we ran out of time, and there is a Q&A session. There was going to be a Q&A session, but we ran out of our time. I can take one question, if any, at least one. But is are there any questions uh, who would like to ask uh, any of these speakers? Yes, please introduce yourself and please address the person whom you're asking your question. Hi. My name is Merve Erdem Berger. I'm coming from Ankara University, and I would like to thank all the speakers. I uh, I got two questions. One is to Miss Arzu, and the other is to Professor Ashkin. Before asking Miss Arzu my question, I would like to make an addition. When we I hear something about law, you know, I just wanted to make a contribution. The financial crime uh, was committed in the U.S. Uh, division of the International Space uh, Station. Uh, when the states register their own space vehicles and when they place it on, a, uh, on an aerial body or when, when it's uh, their registered vehicle, the jurisdiction is uh, the U.S and what kind of an action will be taken, will be resolved with the U.S. law. Now, my question is quite different. Uh, uh, you were talking about the development and the future of the space accounting. So what kind of a development there will be in Turkey? And would there be in a dev any development soon? And as far as you're following it in Turkey, how will the space industry be shaped? And Professor Ashkan, I would like to thank you a lot uh, because uh, in, uh, we are very much interested in space security, but perhaps international relations are left incomplete. So the uh, energy or weapons to be placed on the moon was your topic. But as per the lunar deal, the moon deal, nuclear weapons and other the weapons of mass destruction placing it on uh, bodies, foreign uh, bodies, they were banned. But even if it's not accepted, when you look at the letter and the spirit of the law, and all uh, weapons of mass destruction are not allowed to be placed, nevertheless, even if it's not governed by laws. But still, how do you assess the fact that the space actors can nevertheless act on this and place those weapons of mass destruction there? Thank you very much for this very good, uh, for this very relevant question. So our expectation is uh, because accounting is an applied science, and it starts with accounting. It's at all there's a history of mankind, and it has existed since uh, this, uh, the beginning of agriculture 5,000 years ago. Sumerians, for example, kept records on some clay tablets and then papyrus and also and people started writing on letter as well. And also the, the reason why I call the agricultural evolution, people were afraid, very scared of being in and prey, being prey to wild animals. And then people started to and they uh, produce some grains uh, and also they produce certain products and then money was used as an instrument of uh, exchange and then accounting uh, also emerged as well and also its shape has evolved depending on technology and also needs as well it was written on clay 
and tablets and also people started writing on letter and then started writing in notebooks and then we have banknotes as well so the uh, revenue administration and has an electronic application it is a very remarkable investment and 600 uh, software companies came together to form and add consortium so so so it's an uh, award-winning system in Europe. Within that system, and so uh, the accountants, uh, financial advisor accountants, are the implementers of this, and also, so we have a, we are a driving force in order to change certain things in accounting, and also, and so he is trying to open space for us in the fa in rapidly changing world. If we cannot create information and also benefits for enterprises, and also the accounting that's needed by a tradesman is not the same for a multinational company. And you cannot implement the same things for, for the two, and you cannot also achieve the same productivity. And so uh, space accounting emerged uh, when needed by the activities. For example, E-Trade e uh, has and develop very rapidly and everything that doesn't change and adopt is bound to get lost. That's why and in the e-application trainings to our uh, financial advisors and also to our, uh, to our accountants, we keep, uh, we keep telling people that uh, the curricula should, should, cha should be changed and also the legal uh, arrangements should be adopted as well and also the uh, the revenues presidency and issued some communiques based on law, and also we were the ones who, who read and also interpreted. So they said, how are we going to issue uh, our invoices? And then people had difficulty in perceiving the electronic use, and also there were some periods as well. So, so the people, nobody was able to perceive the, the digital. However, without accounting, there was no inflow of money. So uh, everything was disrupted. There was no production and also no sale was uh, realizing because there was no invoicing. And so so within a system that's a uh, award warning and supported by the, the, the, the government and all the accountants and uh, were trained very intensely because they the state supported it and they created the legal infrastructure. Without a legal infrastructure, the accountants uh, will be meeting the need. However, uh, so in, in the uh, in the uh, in the absence of a legislation, we can only give comment, make comments, and uh, or give advice to people. When a need emerged about space, there is a very rapid change and also transformation as well. And so we were so excited when a space agency uh, was established. They have great investments and we are watching with investments as well and also we were encouraged by the fact that the fact that all Vogue may took initiative about uh, space as well the more this gets widespread and everybody is talking about awareness and the, the more uh, uh, people's awareness rises and whenever there is a need and when, whenever there is a product produced to the market and when there is a buyer for it and also, when our state and our uh, enterprises get involved in space-related activities, then and also there will be a parallel increase in the number of space activities as well. Uh, so there is resistance to, uh, resistance to change. It was uh, these were very difficult to break. The pandemic had many negative impacts. However, it has made it easier for people to accept certain things, and most people are aware of the necessity and importance also of adaptation as well. We're hopeful, and but this will be only as fast as uh, Turkey and also our enterprises. Thank you very much. This is inaudible. In Turkey is implementing the international accounting standards. We have a public audit or um, board uh, in terms of accounting and also reporting. And so we are going parallel to international uh, norms. And um, without a legal arrangement, uh, we cannot make measurements. And that's what, because I have to act accordingly. But let me tell you something brief.
So, uh, for example, when we're allocating depreci uh, depreciation based on a measurement about the future value of, a, uh, of an asset, uh, so we should know uh, for how much that I'll be able to sell it 10 years from now. So it wasn't down to earth. Uh, however, thanks to technology and also the le legislation, uh, now this is possible. When it is made possible, then, uh, so we are uh, ready to adapt our, uh, adapt to this, and both in terms of the public and also the regulators. Thank you very much. <laughs> We'd like to thank Arzu and Murat very much, and also Inji Anam. So this microparticle laser weapon um, is part of the Star Wars strategy of the U.S., which they put forward in 1985. The U.S. has uh, always uh, defended that all sorts of weapons aimed at defense can be placed in space. When the space forces, uh, when the space force was established, they superseded. So uh, they, so they talked about uh, building an incredible power. And so these three states, uh, Russia, America, and also China, are the uh, so the permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations. Not only among themselves but against uh, all the threats coming from space. It could be a killer satellite planet or an asteroid. And they believe that a high energy system, uh, so a high, uh, a high energy weapon should be destroyed before reaching uh, the Earth. And so the United States, China, and so, and France, England, and also China, and the uh, United States, and also America can make the world accept this. And America have always believed that weapons can exist in space as long as they are not offensive. And the US is not a party to any of the treaties today in terms of environment. And also, the, this, this, has an this has an invisible nature as well. Uh, for example, you can, for example, uh, so this uh, microparticle laser uh, beam system cannot be understood. Uh, for example, Detroit burned, uh, for example, in uh, a couple of years ago, but nobody understood how it happened. And America is trying this within its own body as well. For example, they're having some bushfires over the recent years and all the triggering of earthquakes, for example, by a beam or by a mass of beam coming from a space. And people think it's a meteor, but there are discussions that there, these are not really meteors, and also, so these uh, weapons exist now. However, the United States they say that they, they are uh, def, uh, they are for def, uh, def, uh, defense purposes, not uh, uh, uh, neither uh, the outer space uh, treatment or nor the other treatments will have any effect as long as there is uh, there is a war. There are suspicions of China as well, and also China is going to orbit a, a space a, a project, and they believe that there will be some cl uh, clandestine projects taking place there, and also uh, reflecting using a mirror. So using a uh, mirror is, is a weapon of Hitler. So by uh, placing mirrors to the moon, so he, did, he also considered destroying his rivals. So the Americans wants to use this for global warming, and China want to use this to benefit from solar energy. However, the United Nations is able, uh, is thinking of, for example, building a nuclear reactor on the face of the moon as well. Uh, so in the Star Wars, so the Supreme, so there uh, there was a weapon called the Star of Death, and you can turn the moon into that as well. So there can be a a very high energy system deployed on the moon, but it's not a threat coming from the, from the, uh, the face of the Earth. And over the recent years, uh, so. So they have stated, uh, for example, they have uh, started, for example, announcing the concept of aliens as well, and CIA, and also Harvard University, and uh, are talking about uh, uh, the, the existence of aliens as well. So, uh, so there are three countries which will claim to protect people from such threats, and so. So they will come out. I believe that they will come up with some arguments. Uh, to, pr to protect armament uh, with the claims of defending the world. So, so these laser microparticle weapons cannot be seen. Uh, so they come uh, as a ball of fire, but you can't know who it was uh, shot by or fired by, where it's coming from, and also earthquake creation, uh, triggering, and also Evan Wall, uh, 
uh, uh, so this is a ball, this is a laser ball, and it can, if it falls into a volcano, there, there can be, a, for example, volcano explosion, and also if it falls on a fault line, then there, uh, some earthquake can be triggered. This is an incredibly ex uh, destructive thing, but it's uh, uncertain. In order to be able to destroy the hypersonic uh, missile, then uh, China, as uh, so well South Korea, you should be able to use the uh, the, the laser system they have and so the United States said uh, we will be placing this on the satellite and also I'll print uh, this time I'll be defending myself in the face of the hyper uh, missile and so you so these five uh, countries so the uh, Security Council of the United Nations uh, so they say that uh, they, they, they say that they, they will understand the result, this, this responsibility to defend the world as well. And also, uh, you can also hear some different uh, announcements about the space in the meetings of NASA as well. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed all the papers and thank you very much. And indeed, we would like to thank this beautiful, uh, the organizers of this beautiful meeting, as well as the dean, the dean of the Faculty of Economy, the Faculty of Law, the executives of the uh, observatory, the Istanbul University, and everyone who made this possible. And I would like to close the session hereby. <laughs> This is uh, our plaque of appreciation by the Dean of Economy of uh, Faculty of Economy. Sayın Cansu Soylu'ya katılım belgesini vermek üzere İktisat Fakültesi Öğretim Üyesi Sayın Doktor Öğretim Üyesi Zeki Özen'i sahneye davet
uzayda barışı temin etmek mümkün olacak mı sorusunun cevabı ekonomiktir. Ekonomik değeri arttıkça paylaşım sorunu büyüyecek ve üzülerek ifade ediyorum çatışma kaçınılmazdır. Neden? Çünkü insanlık tarihi boyunca bölüşüm kavgası bitmemiştir. O nedenle bu kavga uzayda da devam edecek. Evet ülkelerin uzayda e, bilgi üretimi için, uzayda varlık gösterebilmeleri için hiç kuşkusuz işbirliğine ihtiyaçları var. Ve bugüne kadar çok yoğun bir şekilde bu işbirliklerini götürdüler. Yine üzülerek bunu ifade ediyorum. Buradaki ilerleme ve buradaki ekonomik değer, buradaki askeri amaçlar ön plana çıktıkça bu bilgilerin artık e, paylaşılmasından da yavaş yavaş vazgeçileceği kanaatindeyim. İnşallah yanılırım. Yine e, çok önemli hususlardan biri uzayı çöplüğe dönüştürecek miyiz? Bunun da örneği var. Dünyayı e, çöplüğe dönüştürdük. Dolayısıyla e, uzayı koruyabilir miyiz? Çok uyanık, çok akıllıca bakmamız lazım. Yüz bin uydunun fırlatılacağını düşündüğümüzde başımızda nelerin olacağını, başımızda nelerin döneceğini herhalde tahmin etmek zor olmayacak. Çok gururlandıran e, bir takım verilere, bilgilere de sahip oldum. Düşünün ülkemizin bir e, üniversitesinin kampüsünde uydu yapıyor ve ihraç ediyor. Bunun gururu gerçekten e, hissetmek için e, çaba göstermeye gerek yok. Dolayısıyla yine e, robot teknolojisinde dünyadan birkaç yıl öndeyiz gibi bir iddia ile ortaya çıkılmış olmasının yarattığı gururu, sevinci taşıdığımı ifade edeyim. Ee, yine belki de e, çok böyle planlı yapmadık ama şuna her zaman inandık. Hayal edilemeyen hiçbir şey gerçekleştirilir. Dolayısıyla bu sempozyumu hayal ettiğimizde Türkiye'nin özellikle uzaydaki gelişimiyle bu kadar paralel gideceğini dürüstçe söylemek gerekirse çok planlamamıştık. Ama öyle bir e, sonuçla karşı karşıyayız ki Türkiye'deki e, uzay çalışmalarının gelişmesine paralel hatta uzay çalışmalarının kurumsallaşmasına paralel bu sempozyumun devam ediyor olması bize bir takım sorumluluklar yüklüyor. Dolayısıyla e, açılışta e, hukuk akademisi çok kıymetli tekanı söyledi. Devam etmeli dedi. Aynı kanaatiyim. Dolayısıyla hiçbir tereddütümüz yok. Bu çalışmalar geleneksel bir hale gelmeli. E, bir üzüntüm var. Geçmiş yayını online olarak e, yayınladık. Şey, bildiriler online olarak yayınladık ama fiziksel olarak kitaplarımızı sizinle buluşturamadık ama basım aşamasında e, umarım çok uzamadan o kitabı da gün yüzüne çıkarırız ve bugün burada yapılan açıklamalarda yine hem online olarak hem de fiziksel bir baskıyla e, şeye kavuşturulacak, okuyucularla buluşturulacak ama bir hususun altını daha çizeyim. İki gündür verilen bütün e, bilgiler, sunumlar kayıt altına alındı, canlı olarak yayınlandı. Bir iki veri hemen sizinle paylaşayım. Türkçe yayınımız yaklaşık 800 kişi tarafından takip edildi. İngilizce yayınımız yaklaşık 500 kişi tarafından takip edildi ve İktisat Fakültemizin YouTube kanalında kalıcı olacak. İnanıyorum ki bu binlerce e, izleyiciyle buluşacaktır. E, bütün bu söylediklerimi toparlamak gerekirse e, doğru bir yoldayız. E, hedefimiz doğru, amacımız doğru, e, yöntemlerimiz doğru ama biraz daha geliştirmemiz gerekiyor. Biraz daha uluslararası bir boyut katmamız e, gerekiyor. Yine şimdi aklıma gelen bir bilgi daha söyleyeyim. Hem İngilizce olarak e, yayınladık hem de Türkçe olarak yayınladık. Buradaki bütün sunumları hem Türkçe hem de İngilizce takip etme imkanı var. Katkıda bulunanlara bir kez daha teşekkür ediyorum. Bilmiyorum hukuk akademisinin dekanı konuşmak isterler mi? Bir kapanış konuşması yaparlar mı? E, ben hem işten sevgi, saygılar sunuyorum. Katkılar için teşekkür ediyorum.